um, uh, got some things, some movement. We got uh, elective surgeries, we got some golf courses, uh, parks, and some other areas open uh, with more strings attached than we cared for. But um, nonetheless, it was it was a step in the right direction and a safe step, um, I thought. Uh, next, we also uh, had pushed very hard uh, to open up uh, Illinois main streets across the at least the region. Um, that remains a priority that we feel can be done safely. Um, most recently, uh, uh, as most of Thursday recently, night, Friday morning, discussions continued and a plan um, of a, a another regional approach opening uh, was sent to the governor just uh, late this afternoon, uh, as we are hoping uh, that he will have the opportunity very, very soon uh, to see the status of what parts of that uh, could be implemented. Uh, and so whether it's the, the uh, Illinois Congressional District, whether it's the House Republican side of things, whether it's businesses, whether it's individual constituents, um, everyone is pushing uh, business back open to some degree, uh, shape or form. And so um, my purpose tonight was to check in. I talked with uh, mayors uh, since the beginning of this. I've talked to council people. I've, I've tried to do what we're doing here tonight. I've been out in the communities uh, listening, uh, practicing social distancing, of course. Um, and, and obviously, as you all have experienced, uh, it's, it's very much a, a mixed bag, depending on where you're at and people's um, uh, positions. However, um, I do want to talk just briefly about bringing it closer to home and to normal in that case. Um, my office has continued to be open as an essential, uh, essential business, uh, dealing with a, a, a huge influx of issues with constituents um, across the spectrum, as I'm sure all of you can um, understand, uh, primarily recently the unemployment side of things. Um, however, um, we continue to uh, respond to the best of our ability, uh, answer the hundreds of emails, phone calls, um, and do that, as I said, to the best of our ability. In particular, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, DCEO, who the governor is charged with the, uh, abil the ability, if you will, I guess, of uh, uh, navigating through some of these executive orders and related to business and what can and can't fly. Uh, some local, in fact, uh, Kathleen Lorenz, I have pointed some constituents uh, our way to discuss and look at their plans. We have sent those plans in. Um, we've had minimal uh, success in some variations of some things and other things um, that did not fly, but will certainly still be part of uh, an, a, um, a way to look at things with certain businesses and a safely re reopening. So I am cautiously optimistic that uh, we can find a, uh, a common ground area. We can get business reopened before May 30th some degree uh, across the state, especially in regions that we've identified based on the scientific studies. I won't get into all that uh, with you. I know you've got a, a, a full packed agenda. I just merely wanted to check in. And Thank you. I think we can take one or two questions. We don't have time for a full on discussion tonight. I know uh, Representative Brady is incredibly accessible. If you do have um, uh, further questions, uh, that might be a better time to do it. But if anybody's got a quick one right now. Um, Ms. Smith. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, um, Representative Brady, uh, I know that a big concern is the testing. And as much as uh, businesses and individuals want to see Illinois opened up again, until we have a better understanding of just how much the virus is prevalent in our community, which we cannot know unless we have a broader range of testing and um, reading the news recently, the the people taking advantage of that. Um, do you foresee when 
that testing site will be open to anyone who wishes to get a test, whether or not they're an essential worker or asymptomatic or um, even have any any um, exposure to someone with the virus. Um, that time frame varies. Um, then a, a time frame that varies the last um, time. Then as far as time frame varies the last time. Then as far as time frame varies the last time. Then as time frame varies the last time. In fact, uh, I believe it was late Friday afternoon. Um, there was a uh, meeting that was occurring with um, individuals, and uh, in particular, I believe Roman. Uh, to see if they could get some assistance in that turnaround time. And that's uh, something I need to check back on. Thank you, Representative Brady. That uh, helpful. Again, I think if there are other questions, um, um, I know uh, City Manager Reese is uh, in contact with the uh, uh, County Health Department almost on a daily basis for updates of information. There's a lot of information being put out. I think the governor puts information out two times a week uh, in, in a uh, press conference and that. So, and, and again, Dan is always available and accessible. So if you have further, reach out to him. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. I have my hand up. I've got my hand up. Oh. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Brady or um, um, Representative Brady. This is Stan Nord. Um, Stan. <clears throat> there are some towns that are, um, taking the opening into their own hands and opening up like East Peoria is one of the closer ones. And I understand you're working on doing something similar, but at a regional level, um, could you speak to your thoughts of normal following suit with um, doing something like East Peoria versus waiting for the state, well, for our state representatives to open it up on a regional basis? Sure. Um, my feeling is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe Bloomington and Normal have, through their own equivalent executive order, made uh, actions in regards to that. Um, whether it's um, the sheriffs or state's attorneys or whomever of a particular county or a town uh, and what they are doing or not doing in the way of opening up, I can certainly understand um, everyone's different approaches here. Uh, people have to do what they 
believe they're charged to do as an elected official in particular. But my concern is that that with the well intentions that down the road, there's not greater harm through means of something with the state, to the, either the attorney general's office, uh, liquor licenses, business permits to the state, et cetera, that becomes some point of a, uh, uh, a issue of litigation because of their uh, interpretation of how they want to handle things for their own business. There's that balance we have to strike uh, in this time. And um, I, I don't want to see the, the uh, good intentions down the road cause someone more problems. Not, not only speaking from the health side, but we're talking about from the business side. The sooner we can get a plan, we can get a, a fair approach and, and a fair piece of that plan. We know what we have stand, what we propose is not going to meet, meet everything. We, we saw what we proposed and we got some things that was watered down uh, to some degree, but it was a start. So that's what I'm hopeful for. Um, so as a follow-up question, would you recommend the town of normal not look at doing something and waiting for you at the state level to address this issue? Uh, uh, can, we're we're going to wrap this up. Again, reach out to, to Dan for questions. Uh, okay, sure. Uh, Just because I've got a lot of constituents that have called asking this. So Dan, uh, I will follow up with you. We all have time. We all have. That would be great. I appreciate that, Stan. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. It's nice to be with you all. I know you're uh, working diligently and trying to figure things out just like the rest of us. Thanks. Um, and uh, Zach Deepmeyer from uh, Rivian Automotive. He's the uh, communications director for Rivian. Uh, wanted to speak briefly to us tonight, too. So go ahead, Zach. Well, I'll keep it brief. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council, uh, for allowing me to be here. Um, here mostly for uh, questions and guidance. Uh, you should have all received the letter from our CEO, RJ Scaringe, uh, detailing uh, from the original agreement with the town. Um, we have eclipsed those requirements for the million dollar grant provision and uh, just really wanted to let you know that uh, we appreciate it, but we will not be seeking that. Um, there's, there's not a ton that a pre-production company can do uh, during a global pandemic, but uh, we want to be um, as as faithful to the partnership that we have with the town of Normal and just let you know we are so appreciative of the support and, uh, and the patience. So uh, we are ever closer to production and uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, we're here to answer those questions and uh, getting more and more excited every day to, to share a little bit more. Uh, we'll have some more information coming out in the next several weeks about some of our suppliers and uh, uh, a, a good deal of our construction around the uh, facility as well. So just uh, wanted to say thanks. Uh, thank you, Zach. And, and pass on uh, our, our uh, thanks to RJ Scaringe. I mean, it's it shows what a, uh, a partnership that Town of Normal and Rivian has. It just, uh, it, it's something that was concerning us and obviously concerning you as a corporate citizen. So thank you. Absolutely. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Pam Reese to uh, introduce the topics we're going to be speaking on tonight or hearing about, I should say. Exactly. exactly. Thank you, Mayor Coos. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. All right. Good. Um, we have a couple of items that we would like to address during the work session this evening. I Just a matter of detail, I want to double check with the city clerk or city attorney, make sure we're okay because we didn't do roll call or pledge of allegiance per, per the agenda. So are we okay to just keep moving forward in terms of our items? Thumbs up? Okay. All right. So the first item on the agenda this evening is bringing council up to speed with the topic of um, emergency medical services to the village of Hudson and Hudson Fire Protection District. And I wanted to take just a few moments of council's time this evening to um, allow Fire Chief McHumor to explain the situation and um, share with council what we are going to be recommending and see if there's support to move forward. And if there is, we will return to council at an upcoming meeting with an actual agreement for the normal fire department to provide emergency medical services to the fire protection district um, of, of Hudson. And so uh, Chief Humor is on the call. I'm going to ask Chief Humor to unmute 
and just give us the, the uh, summary of what we are proposing and how that uh, would impact our operation. So Chief. Um, can you hear me? Great. Um, so I, I just wanted to give you kind of a quick rundown of, of what we've been talking about and working with with the uh, with the Hudson Fire Protection District. Uh, about a year ago, actually in July of 2019, um, we had a meeting um, with their officers and um, started to discuss the possibility of us uh, taking over a, a contractual um, obligation to run uh, EMS calls in the Hudson Fire Protection District, which is something that is very similar to what we're doing in the Tawanda Fire Protection District. We've been doing that since about 2014. And so it would be very similar to that. I know some of, of uh, the council members and the mayor were on the board at that time um, and voted in support of that. And so basically um, the Hudson Fire Protection District, they respond or transport about 140 to 150 patients per year out of the Hudson Fire Protection District. And that covers about 50 square miles actually. So it's not just the village of Hudson, it's part of uh, Lake Bloomington, um, Lake Evergreen, and uh, some of that area uh, up there. Um, currently out of those 140 or 150 calls, um, last year we responded up there 47 times to assist with paramedic level transport. So if the patient was in need of uh, a paramedic, so the medications or IVs, intubation, those types of things, uh, we went up there and responded and assisted them and, and jumped on board their ambulance and uh, transported the patient uh, with their ambulance uh, to the hospital. So really we're only talking about around 100 calls more per year. And just to give you an idea, um, the, the normal fire department, our calls increase around 300 calls a year, just on a, on a yearly basis, just through uh, more growth in the community and, and uh, things that are happening in the community. So, uh, you know, 150 calls is not a huge increase um, right off the bat. So, um, as a part of discussions of the agreement or the contract, um, Hudson receives money um, through a tax levy for emergency medical services, and it's right around $300,000 a year. And so as, as we looked at, at that amount of money, um, in order for this to work efficiently, um, Hudson is going to need to retain some of that money to uh, pay for training, pay for equipment, and pay for some manpower costs um, because during the daytime there's a uh, you know a, a shortage of uh, volunteer firefighters and so we want to make sure that um, you know the patients in the Hudson Fire Protection District are going to have uh, you know patient care at the bedside in a in a very short amount of time you know four or five six minutes like that um, obviously it's going to take us you know in certain places, it's gonna take us to get to the village of Hudson. It's about 12 minutes from our station three on Rab Road or to the farthest portion of the lake area. It could be up to 18 minutes to respond up there. So we wanna make sure that we have a good and robust uh, first response EMS system from Hudson to go there and start patient care, place the patient on oxygen and give life saving uh, procedures or measures uh, before we arrive. So um, that will uh, allow us to help to fund some of that out of that $300,000. And so we are still in the process of negotiating the contract a little bit. We're very close. We originally asked for $230,000 um, and they uh, responded back that they would like to see it more of $220,000. And so I responded back 225, and so we're we're still we're still kind of going back and forth. Also, as a part of that, um, you know, we would be billing the patients for the patient transports. And so um, last year, um, Hudson billed about sixty five thousand dollars, and they recovered about forty two thousand dollars from uh, private insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid, that type of thing. Um, and so we would also 
um, be able to bill the patients. We should be able to bill at a little bit higher level because of the paramedic level that we're at at the ALS level. Medicare and um, Medicaid and uh, private insurance pay at a higher level um, for those skill levels. And so we should, you know, probably, I'm thinking in the neighborhood of about another $10,000 or something like that. We should be able to, to do that. Um, you know, this would be no increase in manpower um, on our end or capital purchases as far as equipment, ambulances, those types of things. It would just be built into our normal response, uh, similar to like what we do in uh, Tawanda, as I had indicated. Um, so I'm not sure if, if you have any questions um, about yeah, this. I, I know one of the one of the things that that was brought up by several of the council members, um, you know, when we did the two on ones, was uh, you know what does this mean for um, the residents of the town of Normal? You know, if there's an ambulance call in Hudson, and I need an ambulance at my house, you know, is one going to be available? And the answer is yes. Um, if you remember um, back when we purchased the two new engines um, last summer, those are ALS engines. So paramedics ride on those ambulances and have all the equipment on there that's carried on the ambulances, the drug therapies, those types of things. And so we will still maintain those obviously within the city limits. And so we'll still be responding within you know four and a half to five minutes throughout the community um, to, uh, to start ALS care. Um, if one of our ambulances is not available, um, you know, obviously we have two others in the community at the other fire stations. So they would respond um, to the call. And um, as far as paramedics go, you know, just because the ambulance shows up or, or responds to the scene, that doesn't mean that we just load them in the ambulance and go just as quickly as we can to the hospital. Those are kind of the old days, you know, of, of, of EMS. And so today with the paramedics, you know, they need to assess the patient. They might need to start IVs. They might need to start drug therapies, oxygen, ther oxygen therapies, those kind of things. And that all takes a few minutes. That takes anywhere from 12 to 15 minutes to get that type of care started, get them on the cardiac monitor, those kind of things. And so by that time, if one of our, you know, one of our ambulances will be there to transport the patient, or we could rely on mutual aid um, with Bloomington, um, to transport that patient. And we can get an ambulance from Bloomington for mutual aid within the 12 to 15 minute um, response time um, that we're talking about. So really no time would be lost in transporting the patient if there wasn't one of the ambulance available. Um, currently, uh, you know, last year we responded mutual aid with two Bloomington uh, 41 times and they responded to normal for mutual aid 36 times just in the normal course of business. Um, it's, it's kind of the situation where, you know, when it rains, it pours, you know, you get three ambulance calls right in a way, uh, you know, right in line. Um, and sometimes we need to call for mutual aid, but that's, that's not uncommon. We work very closely um, together um, on our, with our mutual aid partners. In fact, it's a part of the law that you have to have mutual aid with all of the responding agencies um, in your area. Um, so for these types of things, so that ambulances are available whenever they're needed. I'm sorry, Pam, go ahead. No, thank you, Chief. I did want to summarize and put it into context for council. Um, in terms of the number of calls uh, for mutual aid, as well as the number of calls that we predict going to Hudson Fire Protection District, if council supports this, um, the normal fire department has over 5,000 calls for service for EMS right. at each year. And we see about a 3% increase per year just based on our, our, our existing population. So um, if Hudson has 140 to 150 calls per year, we currently already go on 40 or so calls to do paramedic intercepts. So the number of new calls for us to respond to would be about 100. That sounds like a lot of calls, but when we're doing over 5,000, it's basically not a, a significant impact to our calls for service. That's so we, we are asking council for thumbs up or um, not of approval 
um, to continue discussions with the Village of Hudson. And if we move forward, we will return to council with a formal agreement um, to provide uh, emergency medical services to the Hudson Fire Protection District. And it would not be um, dissimilar to our current fire protection or uh, level of service to the Village of Tawanda and Tawanda Fire Protection District. In the case of Hudson, though, we would make sure that they maintain a first responder program. So with that's that's all the information staff has to offer, but we can answer questions. I guess one other thing, Pam, that I would add is that um, as a part of that contract, um, there's a 3% escalator in there also. So every year the the, the fee would go up 3%. That, that's true. Thank you, Chief. That would be in our draft agreement that we would bring to council. It would, we're, we're proposing a, a relatively short-term agreement, which gives us a couple of years to experience this and see how it works. We would propose a three-year agreement and um, see see what works. And during that three-year period, as Chief just mentioned, there would be an inflationary increase. Thank you. Mr. McCarthy. Thanks, Chief. Um, uh, as I understand from the information, I just want to clarify that uh, you're not anticipating any staffing changes as a result of this, and we can handle it for the foreseeable future without any disruption. And it's good to know about the response times. That's really, really good. Um, so from your perspective, this is handleable, capable, and and really straight up just an additional revenue stream for the normal fire department. Absolutely that, correct. That is true. Well, that's good and glad to hear that we can handle it and you don't foresee any uh, increased cost with that. So thanks very much. I'm supportive. Thank you. A uh, reminder to council members, when you're done speaking, can you um, lower your hand on the... Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Norton. Um, thank you, Chief Hemer. Um, I think it's great that we can help another community with safety issues. I think anytime we can help somebody with any safety issue, we should. Um, but um, one thing that I think is worthwhile to point out, um, our, our fire and ambulance response times are part of the competitive advantage of living in a city, you know, Bloomington normal. So we need to realize that when we offer this advantage to towns that are outside, they don't pay the same municipal the uh, the uh, same municipal tax as we do. So it gives them more. It gives people more of an incentive to step outside of Bloomington normal. And you know, I think that's a downside. But the safety aspect always trumps that. Um, I just think it's good to point out one thing I would request is if a retirement center or something that's going to you know, generate more calls than what's anticipated, if that happens, that we have some mechanism to address those additional calls because the brunt of that expense will fall on the people living in normal. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, further on, on this issue, uh, Ms. Cummings. Sorry, um, two things. My space bar isn't working and I'm not able to see to do the raise the hand. So I apologize. I'll figure that out in a moment. Um, so I just wanted to be clear and put this um, in numbers perspective. When I took a look and you can verify, so the increase we're looking at, I know you gave raw numbers, but it's roughly a 2% increase in calls if, um, if we're looking at 100 and then that would only be possibly if, you know, based off of the numbers you provided on um, transfers and say that we did an equal ratio um, to have those being, you know, the increase matching the 2% increase, we're still only at a 1% of transfer calls. Did I, did I do my math right about, about right for that? Yeah, that, that, that sounds right. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that is correct. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I think for this, you know, I think this is something I would gladly support, um, certainly given an opportunity for them to um, have more efficient service where they are um, and also bring in another partnership 
for us. Um, I think it, you know, since in recent calls and only a possibility of approximately 1% um, of transfer calls to any of our neighboring partners. Um, I don't see it being an overburden to anyone. It's actually a win-win. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, the only thing I'll add is just a reminder to council, um, and Chief mentioned it, and most of the calls to Hudson that we currently perform in terms of um, paramedic intercepts are coming from station three, which is the station located on Rab Road. Um, as we move forward with our um, fire station relocation plan and relocate ultimately all three of the fire stations so that we more effectively are located to serve our community within the standardized response times. Station three is the last one to be relocated. Once that happens, um, then of course we will, we, we believe we will be well situated to respond within our corporate limits um, within the um, the generally accepted response times um, for the entire community and for um, our three stations. So um, that's just something that will come down. Um, it's, it's not in our five-year budget right now, but it is uh, the next step. Ms. Lorenz. Yes, thank you. Um, Chief Humer, when we talked about this, um, you, I think, mentioned something about um, an, a three-year contract to start, but also an escape clause too. Can you talk a little bit about the escape clause? Right. We, you're absolutely right about the the three-year contract. And usually, for example, like the Tawanda contract, it, it was a three-year contract, and then it had an automatic renewal as long as somebody um, didn't uh, want to uh, cancel the contract. They had to give six months' notice for either party because you just can't start and stop EMS service, you know, because there's equipment and training and those kind of things that are involved in there. Um, we're not totally done, um, like I said, with the contract, but um, our plan is to have a three-year contract and to have a, a, a six months out within that three years. So that if something happens similar to what, you know, Mr. Nord said, um, that some big entity comes there and increases our responses and um, for whatever reason, uh, you know, Hudson would say, no, you know, we have a contract or whatever. We could say, okay, well, we want out of the contract in six months because it's financially uh, draining uh, to the town and to the department, you know, that we could do that. So I think um, um, City Manager Reese is looking for a nod or a, a thumbs up to proceed on this. Um, getting a strong All right. Go right ahead. All right, thank you. Then we will return to council with that agreement on an upcoming uh, city council agenda. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chief. Um, Mayor and Council, the next thing we would like to talk about is providing you with an update on our uh, current status of our fiscal year 2020-21 budget which our fiscal year just began on April 1st. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic really started to impact um, the state of Illinois with the stay at home orders and such in mid-March, which is the very end of our last fiscal year. We would like to take the next uh, 25 minutes or so and just give council a high level overview so you understand what it is that we are tracking on a, on a daily weekly basis and um, where we are forecasting things to be. But please know that this is just the first meeting. We intend to keep council apprised and I'm sure there will be a number of upcoming work sessions where we talk. We will talk in more detail once we have some actual um, experience to report to you. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask Finance Director Andrew Hewn to unmute and do his presentation. And again, this is a high level overview just to let council know what it is we're reviewing and, and tracking. And, um, and then please just know that we will come back to you probably multiple times as, uh, as the situation dictates. So Andrew, please uh, take over the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Can everyone hear me okay? 
I'm going to, uh, I have about 16 slides to show you. Um, we're going to kind of go through a real high level kind of global look and then get down more to the um, meat and potatoes of the town's uh, fiscal impact. I'm going to switch over to the slideshow now. Hopefully I can do that successfully. So share screen. Can everyone see that screen? Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. So, uh, as obviously has been mentioned, we're we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, everyone is aware of this. Uh, it's affecting all countries, all the states in the all the states in the U.S., all of governments, all private and public par um, organizations, essentially everyone. Uh, and this is certainly unprecedented for for most of us in our lifetime. The the fact that it's so widespread also uh, provides us with a great deal of information to, to get. A, a lot of uh, sources are coming kind of coming full bear in terms of information to share. This, of course, is the, the world stage level, the national level, the local level, the state level. Uh, the town is, is reading and webinars and market updates and obviously medical updates. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an all hands on deck. It's been like that way for at least a couple months now. Uh, we, we certainly rely on a lot of different information. Some of our, our current local partners uh, that we talk to quite often, the NLC, National League of Cities, the U.S. States uh, Conference of Mayors, IML, which is the Municipal League, uh, the Governor's Office, of course, the Illinois Department of Health, uh, are all sources of information for us. This is well, on this slide here. You can see that uh, the NLC put together a survey of about 2,500 cities across the country just to get a simple answer. Will you be affected by this financially? Uh, this was done in early April. And obviously, almost 100% of the cities came back saying, yes, we are going to have uh, some unanticipated declines in revenue. Uh, they, they further broke that down by various uh, revenue uh, sources. Uh, but it's obviously just reinstills the fact that we have, we're all dealing with this uh, at every level of government and private and public industry. Uh, and also we're learning some, some new terms along the way. Uh, obviously the, the, the newest term that is, is, is obviously been said multiple times is, is social distancing. Uh, and that, that the, the, to the, the vast degree that we're social distancing has occurred and occurring, uh, it, it, it equates to an immediate uh, shutdown of economic activity. Uh, and again, this is all known information, but it kind of gives a, a bit of a flow of information for the segue for this presentation. Uh, the impacts of that vary uh, depending on industry, depending on your employment sector. Obviously, if you were working in the, in the retail business or the restaurant and bar business, you are seriously hurting from this situation. Other industries are not hurting. Uh, some are actually accelerating tech firms and so forth. So, uh, but regardless of where you stand on that on, on that economic scale, uh, it's a significant economic impact to to the to the to the globe, to to the U.S., to the state, and certainly to local um, governments uh, like ourselves. One chart I've kind of found interesting that I've gotten um, recently from Commerce uh, Bank, and uh, it kind of speaks to the unemployment side of things. Um, you know, currently, according to the Wall Street Journal, as of today. There are 30 million unemployed people in the U.S. Uh, there's about 158 million jobs in the U.S. And this slide is, is very telling of that. Uh, obviously, with the stay-at-home order, that hit first uh, the restaurants and bars. And then, of course, it um, went to more of a, a even a wider uh, non-essential business situation there. Uh, but you can see uh, from this slide here, in January 2020, and this is in the thousands, uh, there was a baby retail, food and beverage, restaurant, bars, entertainment, hotel and tourism, and transportation. And we are at 30 million people unemployed. And basically that is the sector that has been impacted immediately by this. Um, so you can, you can see that's a 20% of the payroll for all the jobs, 20% uh, of, of the economic activity of payroll for the U.S. And also Commerce has released some, some estimates in terms of unemployment rates for the entire U.S., and they're thinking it will peak around 20 percent. Um, so I think we're kind of getting close to the bottom of that, but clearly uh, this, this has a significant impact economically, particularly in those sectors alone. Uh, and then the question is, so what is this significant cost? Um, why are we incurring this significant cost, and why and what? And, what? Uh, and again, very, very well-known information, but I think it's useful to kind of reiterate again as part of this conversation 
uh, the, the goal is to, in social distancing, is to you know, flatten the curve. We've heard that repeatedly in the newscasts and through our medical experts and so forth. And that simply is to reduce the, the spread to a, to a level that can be maintained um, in our hospital systems. Uh, so that, that's essentially the, the, the goal of the economic shutdown and, and what's occurring across the U.S. Uh, and the world in general. So enough of that. Um, again, that was just some, some information I know you're all aware of, but it, it does serve as some background. Uh, Illinois, uh, specifically, um, on March 16th, restaurant bars had to suspend on-premises consumption. Uh, so they all essentially went to takeout. Not all of them, of course, because some weren't, weren't prepared for takeout. Some do take out, but um, they weren't prepared to take it on a full-time, in terms of full-time role. So many of us just simply closed. Others have developed takeout. Others were kind of more attuned to that. Fast food places, of course, do a lot of that. So kind of across the board reaction to that particular um, executive order. And then, of course, on the 21st of March, uh, the state home order came from the governor, and that further tightened down the economic um, wrench, per se, or pressure. Uh, currently, it's scheduled to end on the 30th of May. And I know there's some easing of restrictions and so forth, but still, it, it is, it's definitely a, an economic um, punch in the gut. Uh, for, for a lot of folks. In terms of the town itself, uh, now we're kind of getting more into the, the fiscal side of the town. And, and before I get too far into that, uh, I just uh, kind of take a step back here and talk about the 2021 budget. You know, we did approve that in early March. Um, that budget cycle went very well. Uh, we, we ended the, we, we end, we're ending the year 1920 in a pretty good position, although we're still closing the books on that right now. Uh, and we started the year 2021 in a very strong position uh, in terms of our fiscal strategies, which is kind of dictates a lot of the town's reserve and cover ratios. The general fund is, is, is meeting its, uh, its reserve level at 15%, so in a good, strong position. We did establish some contingency this year, which was nice. The Open Equipment Reserve Fund has a very strong um, position also right now, and that's going to come into play later on as I speak a couple more slides down. Debt service coverage is in good shape. Water and sewer foot are in good, strong shape. The only fund that was actually a little troubling, and, and you're well aware of this last couple of years, is health and dental fund, which we're, we're in the process of resolving that. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the town has entered this, this stay-at-home order uh, and the economic in, impact of that uh, with what I would characterize as a very strong balance sheet, which is going to be very helpful during this time. So kind of going forward now, the next few slides, we're going to discuss what that impact is, the general fund, and, and really what that impact is to our working capital. Uh, we're going to look at the short-term estimate impact. When I say short-term, I mean this fiscal year, 2021, next 12 months. Uh, we'll look at the longer-term recovery impact. That means the out year. So we're modeling the impact of the, of the, of the economic shutdown for this fiscal year, next 12 months, and we're also modeling the best we can uh, the one, two, and three, and four fiscal year outlooks from there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about timeline for budget actions uh, in terms of when we come back to you. And Pam mentioned this to you earlier, just a moment ago. This is really step one of step 100 in terms of what we're going to be doing between now and when this is finally resolved and recovered fully. So more to come on that. And then we'll discuss some other issues and considerations that, that we're thinking about. We're not necessarily modeling those things, but we will eventually once we have the information available to do so with some degree of confidence. Mr. Hewn, if I could interrupt just for one second before you yes. get going on this slide, I did want to um, indicate to council so that they are aware we are experiencing some live feed issues right now. INT will will fix the feed between this discussion and the Liquor Commission. We'll get the live uh, stream feed fixed. In the meantime, they're they're recording this, and so we will will post this recording, and we'll have the live stream fixed. What I wanted to add in regard to Mr. Hume's comments, though, um, is um, we we had invited uh, Mr. Dietmeyer to participate in and share his comments during this budget work session. He will also be involved in the City Council 7 p.m. regular meeting um, because of the announcement that was made today by Rivian um, and, and because of its significant impact on the general funds, so we thought the timing was appropriate. So Mr. Hewn is going to talk now about the general fund as, as we're now in this COVID pandemic. And I wanted to explain the link between Mr. Dietmeyer's comments and his participation and uh, Rivian's announcement and, and how that is so impactful on our general fund. So we'll get into that detail. Mr. Hewn. 
Sure. Uh, so general fund impact, um, the chart you're looking at right now, the blue bar represents the uh, budgeted revenue for the entire fund for the entire fiscal year in general fund. So $69.9 million is the adopted budget for revenue in general fund. The red bar uh, indicates our new projection based on uh, the COVID um, virus and, and the economic impact from the, the stay at home order in, in Illinois and here in town normal. So about a $10.4 million drop in fund balance, I'm sorry, in, in revenue projections. So about $70 million of revenue is projected for the fiscal year 2021. We're assuming now just under $60 million will be collected for the entire fiscal year because of the economic shutdown. So the question is what, what revenue sources are being impacted? Well, pretty much all of them. Uh, the most significant ones are on the screen now. Uh, local and state shared sales tax, we're estimating almost a 20% drop for the entire fiscal year. Uh, food and beverage, of course, this is the restaurants and bars, a uh, 43% drop. State income tax, an 18% drop. Hotel motel is going to be a 56% drop, and then local motor fuel tax, 35% drop. These um, five revenues here, I'm sorry, six revenues here represent the most significant impacts from, from the uh, the economic shutdown, uh, about 80% of the total decrease is coming from, from these revenue sources. Uh, other ones are smaller ones, this, the, the museum, the Children's Discovery Museum, the theater, you know, and so forth. We're, we're tracking all the revenues, but these are the major ones obviously impacted. Uh, we, do, we did model everything um, to be essentially removal of the stay-at-home order on July 1st. Uh, right now it's looking more like June 1st. Uh, but again, we wanted to kind of get a, a as best worst case scenario as possible just to see what the impact might be for our own planning. Um, and you can see that that's the numbers. To give you a little more background on modeling um, for the state and local sales tax, uh, we basically looked at every single month uh, and then assigned a new percent that we thought we'd collect because of that, because of the month it was in. Um, so, uh, and then we broke it down even further by segment. So we essentially look at all the store, all the, all the business activity. There's about a thousand businesses generating property, generating uh, sales tax for the town. Uh, however, about 80 to 85 of those actually produce about 85% of the total revenue we collect. So we break all of those out separately, monthly. We, we look at them, uh, we kind of, we categorize them in certain, in certain segments. For instance, we would put Home Depot and Menards that we call that kind of our big box home stores, uh, Meyer, Sam's Club, Target, Walmart, we put that into kind of our big general merchandise areas. In fact, in fact those, those five or six places generate the majority of our sales tax. We have restaurants, of course, we also break it down by grocery stores, by uh, car dealerships, pharmacy, specialty, home decor. So we look at all these segments differently and they all have a different impact on the overall sales tax collections. And then we assigned for every single month in those different segments what we thought we'd collect. Uh, just again, by example, for restaurants, we assumed 50% of what we normally collect in March. Uh, for April, we assumed 25%. And then for all of these things, we, we go right about to July and start picking up from there each segment uh, some pick up faster than others, and we only get to about 95% in total for the whole fiscal year. So we're not only are we assuming a significant sharp drop in revenue from tax resources for the first for the, for the April, May, and June, uh, we're not bringing it all the way back to 100% for the entire fiscal year. So again, a fairly conservative picture of our revenue uh, projections. So uh, moving on in terms of kind of our, our budget timeline and our, our budget reaction, um, our immediate budget reaction has been, you know, we want to shore up uh, to the extent we can the general funds working capital position. Uh, this is kind of an immediate short term solution. Uh, what the actions we've taken to date is we, uh, we're going to reduce or eliminate certain transfers from the general fund. Uh, I'm sure you can recall from our budget discussions and just your general knowledge of the budget for the town, the general fund funds uh, what we call a vehicle and reserve fund. So every year it takes money and puts it out of general fund into the vehicle reserve fund. And that fund ultimately supports the purchase of ambulances, waste trucks, uh, fire trucks, police cars, virtually every piece of equipment we have that's significant in vehicles when those come due. We kind of fund it annually. 
Right now, the, that transfer from general fund to vehicle reserve is 1.8 million. Uh, we are going to hold that transfer this year and not make it. Uh, the vehicle reserve fund is in a pretty strong fiscal position. Uh, we look at the five-year budget. So in year five, we're down to our target, uh, but year five is a bit long, a long time away and we can solve that problem between now and then. Right now, we wanna be able to maintain some capital in the general fund. So we're not gonna transfer the 1.8 million. That will not be problematic for the fund. Um, right away. Uh, we're also gonna reduce the transfer to the roadway fund. Another fund, the general fund funds is, is general fund roadway work. Uh, we're gonna cut that transfer in about half, about $400,000. Uh, we're also gonna reduce or limit the transfer to the capital fund. So it, it, the, the general fund you know, funds vehicle reserve fund, roadway fund, and uh, capital fund. So we're reducing and limiting those transfers. Also, obviously the information heard tonight from, from Zach, uh, from Rivian, the fact they're going to forego the million dollar uh, agreed upon payment. Uh, they met their milestones, but the, the good partners they are, they, they, they've chosen not to seek that reimbursement or that rebate. Uh, that's a million dollars we had budgeted for this year to pay out, which we will now be able to retain in general fund, um, uh, which is just a, a, a quite a gift and, and much, obviously much appreciated from the budget side of things and, and from, the, from uh, the public side of things. So that's certainly wonderful and, and very helpful at this time. Uh, so all, all those together amount to about $4.2 million of cash that we're able to maintain in the general fund that we would otherwise transfer under a normal fiscal year. Uh, and, and we're not overly concerned about the, the, the effect on those other funds. Now, they will need to be eventually uh, adjusted, uh, and that'll be part of our process going forward for the next budget cycle. But for now, that, that kind of shores up the general fund. Um, we will certainly come back to... Um, very soon, uh, probably sometime in the summer with what we call mid-year adjustments. Uh, by this time, uh, in around about summertime, we'll have a better feel for how our actuals are coming in compared to our projections. As you probably know that, you know, when, when the sales tax occurs, when it gets earned, we don't get that until two or three months after the actual event. Uh, so when you buy a shirt or, you know, buy a vehicle or buy anything in retail or go to the restaurant, we, we don't get that sales tax until at least three months after the event. So in March, we'll find out uh, what happened in March in uh, April, May, June, in, in June. Um, so that so it takes a while. Food and beverage is about two months. Hotel motel is about a month behind. We have some data right now. And we're looking at it, but uh, it's going to take time for us to see the actuals. We feel pretty comfortable with our, our forecasting right now. So once we have some real numbers to compare against our, our projections, we will certainly come back to you with what we, we consider mid-year adjustments. Uh, and, and right now, to give you a sense of what we are doing, we are working close with all the departments to find out, um, first, we've done a line-by-line -line budget review of all department heads to see what's available, what can be deferred, what can be cut. Um, there's a couple of simple things, you know, travel and training, uh, purchases and maintenance, uh, advertising. There, there's uh, some operating supply, things we can live without for a while. Uh, and we're, we're, we're inventorying that right now and, and starting to get a feel for what might be available in terms of dollars for that. And then our, our final, kind of our final budget review will, will occur probably in fall and winter, which is our regular budget cycle. And this will be the longer term issues to resolve uh, as, as, a, as a, a result of what's going on with, with, the, with the pandemic and the recovery. Um, you know, it's hard to predict when we will fully recover from this. You know, it's, uh, it basically boils down to an economic curve, um, and I'll kind of discuss it next. So, the, what does the recovery curve look like? There's a lot of a lot of estimates about this. You know, is it going to be a V curve? Is it going to be a big V? Is it going to be an L? Is it going to be a W? Um, clearly, it right now is the beginning of a big V. It's been a significant drop, uh, a very steep drop. Um, so that, that 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 economic shutdown was immediate. The economy was, was humming along just fine by all, by all measures and uh, most people believed, but then the switch was turned off in mid-March and that was a dramatic uh, applying to the brakes per se. Uh, now, recovery will not be the same as switching the, flip, switching the, the switch back on. It'll take time and, 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 and energy. Listening to the Fed talk and a lot of the market discussion, they're not expecting to see a full economy until a, a vaccine's in place. Uh, and, and, the, and then even when the full economy comes back, it will come back slowly over time. And I'm not going to get into a lot of debate about that because that's, that's obviously, you know, being discussed 
quite a bit about how to turn the economy back on and what, what portion and what region and who goes first and all those things. But what we are doing here at the town, given the, the fact that it's uncertain recovery time frame, is we're trying to model a couple of different possibilities. Uh, this chart you're seeing now, uh, the very top line, blue line, is essentially the five-year adopted budget revenue levels that we have projected for the five-year budget that was, was approved in March. The, the first drop there, I guess you can consider that kind of a big V, uh, is what we're expecting the revenue to drop down by because of the, in this fiscal year, because of the economic downturn, because of the shutdown. And then returns in one year, uh, just to be a one-year hit, a two-year hit, or a three-year hit. So one-year recovery, two-year recovery for the green, three-year recovery for the red. So it gives you a sense of how we're getting back to our full revenue picture that we, that we essentially projected this year or for the next five years. That, now that has consequences to um, our, our, our fund balance and, and the budget and the general fund. Um, to give you a little more flavor for that, and I, I would ask you to look at this slide uh, in kind of a single way. One, this represents kind of three scenarios. So for forecasting recovery for, the, for a one to three year recovery. So the very first bar there says 2021, one year, $6.1 million drop. So what that is telling you is if we recover in a single year, if we just have the experience of this fiscal year, which is not likely to recover right away, well, let's say we do, then the fund balance drop in the general fund is $6.1 million. We have a $6.1 million problem to solve. Now, switch to another one, the, the 21, 22. We're gonna go two, we're gonna go this entire fiscal year and now recover, and then we're gonna recover sometime next fiscal year a two-year recovery. If that is the situation, then we're projecting an $11.5 million fund balance. Now, I want to also be clear about something. This just includes those immediate reductions of transfers. So we have not done anything else in this model, in these numbers that represent other expense delays or cuts. That'll obviously happen. We're just trying to give the council a feel for just with the immediate measures of cutting the transfers to vehicle reserve, roadway fund, capital fund, the million dollars from Rivian, we, these are the numbers how you translate. If we do other cuts, which we absolutely will, that'll squeeze that number less. So if we, let's say if we go for a three-year uh, recovery, so now we're in 22, 23 fiscal before we finally recover from this, and we, then we do nothing in terms of expense cuts, which is not going to happen, but this gives you a feel for the, the impact. It's a six, $16.5 million drop in fund balance. So again, we will certainly we will certainly deal with it, with that at the appropriate time. You know, we have made immediate we have made immediate budget adjustments. We're looking at other cuts, other delays, and as and essentially as we go out in terms of that that recovery model, the longer it takes, uh, the even the more thoughtful the cut needs to be in terms of what we're doing because it, it basically equates to you know programs and services uh, to to squeeze or, or eliminate or change to deal with, with that kind of drop in fund balance. Um, but I do want to leave you with, at least in the terms of this, that the town did enter this, like I said, in a pretty strong, a very strong position, actually. Uh, we have a, a couple of little pockets of money we can go to when we need to uh, that aren't going to put us in too much of a risk. Uh, they will need to be dealt with later on. But right now, we are in a good fiscal position. We have plenty of working capital to resolve this issue in kind of a thoughtful way. Um, another couple, a couple items just to consider that we're also looking at investment earnings. Um, obviously, are are challenged. Um, the town's funds that we invest are are basically, you know, in a couple of words, bulletproof because they're just fixed income things. Agencies and the CDs, we hold them to maturity, um, and, and they're just not going to be impacted really at all of this. Uh, the pension funding is a little different situation because obviously, as you know, we, we hold a position in equities there and equities are taking a hit uh, as the regular paper, you know this. We're working closely with our, 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 our market advisors on, on both of those pension funds, uh, but there is going to be some reckoning to deal with that. Also, uh, when all the dust settles on, on recovery or maybe before then, the state is going to need money. Uh, right now, the even at the federal level, the Fed is, you know, you know, two trillion, two trillion plus in stimulus package, that that's being financed, and that's gonna that's gonna come to roost for the nation. 
Uh, the state, um, the state of Illinois is, is obviously putting a lot of cash out right now, and they weren't necessarily in a great position going into this. So they're going to be looking at, at something, and it might be looking at municipalities to help solve their, their budget issue once all this is settled. That's hard to quantify. Uh, they obviously have done it in the past, um, and, and we're, we're hopeful they leave us alone, but it's going to come eventually to a reckoning for that. Uh, also, once we, once we get out of this, there'll, there'll be, I guess, what you can refer to as a new normal. Uh, consumer spending is going to look a little different. Um, business models will be a little different. Uh, tech and the digital divide will be a little different. You know, everything is really evolving um, in terms of consumer spending and, and business models. And the longer that we experience kind of this online stay at home Zoom meeting stuff, there'll be, there will be a longer impact on how people spend money how they provide service and how service is delivered. These are all kind of unknowns, but there certainly are going to be some interesting future in the head in terms of that. Uh, this last bullet, uh, pandemic response model. Uh, a pandemic is something that I think everyone's kind of in the back of their mind known about, but never really spent a lot of time kind of budgeting for. Uh, so the, the, this is obviously a, a real thing that can happen, um, no denying that. So I think local governments, state governments, federal governments are going to obviously be more sensitive to this area uh, for the next one. Um, and, and the town will have to react like every local government to that, that situation too. Uh, we, have, we have reserves in place for all kinds of emergencies. Um, we never thought we'd have this kind of emergency that right at, at, during this time, but, but it has happened and, and, and our reserves are there for it. But we can add pandemic to the list of possible emergencies that we'll deal with as part of our reserve funding. Uh, then just this last bullet point, we're we'll going to reach out to all of our advocates and partners, IML, our colleagues, our sister cities, um, the, the, governor's, the governor's office, everyone I've already mentioned, uh, to help us kind of understand the data and then distill it and then, and then bring it forward as, as some kind of recognizable model for our revenue and our budget. Uh, so that was a lot of information. Uh, to share, uh, like Pam mentioned, this was meant to be kind of a, a, a introduction to our situation and also share with you that that the city, uh, the finance department, the city mayor's office, we're, we're looking at this very closely all the time for, for the last couple months. Uh, and this is just the beginning of a discussion base in terms of, of budgeting, uh, reacting to it, uh, cash flow, fund balance. Um, but I, I, can, I, can, I feel comfortable where we're at with our projections. We're, I change them every single day. I look at them honestly in terms of a percent here and there, uh, but I think we're in a good. We're obviously in a good position financially to to, to deal with this. Uh, what will be coming next over the next few months, and honestly, probably as part of the budget cycle this year, is a discussion of of the new reality for the town and and, and budgeting going forward. Uh, so, that's all I have to share. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Hewn. I did want to just highlight a couple things for council. Um, just reiterate uh, Mr. Hain's comments that we entered into this crisis in a very strong financial position, primarily because council has established our target fund balances. And because we have fund balances, the purposes of those fund balances are for a rainy day. This goes way beyond a rainy day, um, but at least it provides us some cushion and allows us some time to be thoughtful in our approach. Um, and not completely reactionary. We want to um, obviously take measures as quickly as possible, which I believe we've done. Um, the other thing I want to point out that is this is this is a you know almost a marathon. We're in this for the long haul, and we'll continue to track things and report back to council and seek council input and guidance on certain matters. Um, I do want to just again point out that these assumptions. Are, are hopefully very conservative in terms of expectations. As Mr. Hume mentioned, our assumptions were that the July 1st was the end of the stay at home order. We really hope that we are wrong. We hope that we're wrong. We just wanted to put out a, an out, a very far out date to make sure we gave ourselves some a very conservative approach. And, and lastly, the uh, two other things. Um, the, as Mr. Hume commented, the immediate steps, kind of the low-hanging fruit that um, retain $4.2 million in our general fund um, are, are primarily due to not transferring money to other accounts because those accounts are in strong financial position and we have time in the future to deal with uh, vehicle and equipment reserve and such. And because, of course, of uh, Rivian, 
uh, making that very gracious um, and generous announcement that they will waive the $1 million incentive, which allows us to retain that um, money in the general fund. So all of those, uh, those steps allow us to keep 4.2 million in the general fund. Um, the last thing I'll mention though, is on a national level, there has been federal action um, to provide relief to municipalities. The issue is that those municipalities have to have a population of a half million or more. And uh, clearly that does not impact Bloomington at normal. So um, we are moving forward with our assumptions as if there is no federal relief because those dollars are targeted elsewhere at this point. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mayor Coos. Thank you, uh, and Andrew, uh, uh, an excellent overview. And I can tell from the last time we talked, you did update it, that there's some, some new information and I appreciate you looking at that every day and, and um, uh, keeping a keen eye on that. Um, we've got time for some few questions. Uh, first is uh, uh, Ms. Smith. Yes, uh, and again, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I know you're probably going crazy with trying to, to stay on top of new information. And I do want to emphasize that an accounting principle is to be conservative so that you are, in, I want to emphasize to anyone hearing this, that you are intentionally trying to make it look realistic and erring on the side of caution so that um, God willing that we will do better than this. But you are in fact, working towards a worst case scenario with the model as you've constructed it. Um, and so um, one of the things I wanted to, to comment on in looking at the expenses in the council report for tonight, the sales tax revenues for January that are being forwarded to Bloomington are actually up from the January 2019. So um, you are using correct correct me if I'm wrong, you are using in our budget, we will be getting so-called normal receipts for January and February pre-shutdown. And that is part of your forecast? That's correct. We don't start forecasting a drop in any of our sales tax revenue, food and beverage, income tax, uh, hotel motel uh, until mid-March. So and I'll, I'll, go ahead. And, and um, on a separate matter, because I'm feeling the time pressure, <laughs> on a separate matter, um, you were mentioning how you, you are aware that we have certain vendors that are um, a large segment of our sales tax receipts. And some of those in the normal taxing district have actually been benefiting from the stay-at-home orders, um, such as the Kroger on College Avenue, um, we have a Schnucks um, uh, north of town um, by the expressway and some of the big box stores that are in here. How did you handle the projections for those vendors? Sure. We, we actually bumped up above 100% of what we expect to collect for a lot of the grocery segment, at least for a couple months. And then we brought it back down to kind of a normalized level. Uh, we, I didn't actually touch the big box stores, although I know in talking to a lot of them personally, they are seeing a significant activity uh, with state home order, but, but I just felt, again, remaining conservative. We said, we'll get 100% of what we thought we'd collect, at least for the first couple months of the pandemic, and then we brought that down, even that one down. So again, getting back to your comment of being conservative, we're, we could have probably bumped that one a bit in that segment, but we haven't. Uh, again, just trying to be, remain conservative. And so um, when, when we were meeting uh, to discuss your uh, preliminary projections, we talked about triggers. So part of the reason you would want to come back to us in uh, the summer is we would start to see some of those uh, collections in the March and April timeframe if we were to delay revising and revisiting these budget numbers around July, August. Is that correct? Correct. We'll have a real good feel um, by the time July closes of how we're looking from, from all that revenue in terms of what occurred in, in uh, April, May, or March, April, May. And, and another trigger that we're waiting on is whether or not IU, ISU announces their plans for the fall and the impact of the student population and just how many students will be coming back to town for on-campus classes. Um, and 
And so we haven't heard from that either. And how have you factored that into your forecast? Right now, the for, right now, the forecast assumes they'll be back in, in October for the fall semester. If they don't, then we would tweak a, a few of the segments uh, of the industry, certainly, you know, all the entertainment areas, uh, restaurant bars, you know, and so forth, that, because we're, what students spend their money on, not that they're all doing that all the time, but they don't, they don't shop at Medards a lot, uh, mostly groceries, mostly uh, convenience stores, gas stores. Uh, entertainment, entertainment venues, things like that. So we would have to adjust down for that with some some percentage. And and the other item that Smith, can you hold for just a second? And I, I would ask that we kind of keep our questions focused uh, on the presentation tonight. There's so much material here. I've got four or five other people that want to speak, and we're limited on our time frame. These are very valid questions. We're going to have opportunities to discuss those as we go along. So I'd, I'd ask you to, to, to everyone here, please limit your questions to the discussion we had tonight. Well, the, the only, the final thing is, is there's no inclusion of any cannabis sales tax in the forecast, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Mr. McCarthy. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Hewn, for as Ms. Smith pointed out, being on top of this minute by minute and being very conservative. Um, uh, I appreciate the approach greatly. Um, I'm going to zoom back up to maybe the 20,000 foot view just to kind of overview process. Um, I'm, I know there's going to be a lot more detail coming. Uh, so if I heard everything accurately from a high level process perspective, um, you've got four million ish ready to help out on this ex expense side should we need it and then as june and july hit and we get actual revenue numbers and actual expense numbers you're going to come back to us with more specific targets uh based on what our actual real experience i know it's all forecast now but once you have real numbers in terms of revenue side you're going to come back to us with more specific requests that i Get that process roughly right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, perfect, thanks. Ms. Lorenz. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Hewn, question back on the point about um, managing the reserve transfers from uh, particularly roadway and, and capital. Those are our pay-as-you-go um, funds for big projects that we like to uh, allocate in a particular year. By um, not making those transfers, generally speaking, and I know you can't get to specifics at this point, but generally speaking, how do you feel the impact will be on some road projects as well as uh, any of the capital projects that might have otherwise um, been expecting those funds for this year? Sure. Uh, roadway funds should probably be able to carry on as usual for this fiscal year. Uh, there's there's enough fund balance there to support that. Uh, we'll need to address it in the next budget cycle to kind of recover that those funds. But for the most part, there'll be little no impact on the roadway work. Um, the capital fund there that that fund is always budgeted very tightly, uh, and we're going to cut that transfer entirely. So we do have cuts um, in terms of projects identified now that we will not be doing. Um, and I'll default to Pam to share those if she if she uh, on this race if she chooses to. But we, we do have a list of cuts in capital that that, are, that we have to back off on. Correct. In in regard to those those capital projects, they're not road or sidewalk related. Um, those are, for example, the um, the town's matching dollars for the Maxwell Park improvement. So we will basically kick that can down the road a little bit, delay the Maxwell Park project for a year. Um, we, we bid that project, it came in over bid, so we were redesigning anyway. So um, it, it's those kind of projects that, that would be delayed um, in, and then we have time between now and next fiscal year to address what we can do in future years. But, but the delay in capital or delay transferring money into the capital fund does not affect any roadway projects. Mr. North. Um, thank you, Mr. Dean. A question, um, we're transferring money from different fund balances, but that money has to be replenished at some point. Um, 
what's your plan on replenishing it? Well, right now, for the, the, the biggest trust we're doing is vehicle and equipment reserve, 1.8 million. Um, it's pretty well funded now, but you're you're correct. Uh, this is not necessarily money that is going to be free free for us to use. Uh, it's all been planned to be spent over the next five years. So by way of example, the vehicle reserve in year five is at its target. We're pretty high right now, but we'll spend that down to year five. So right now, year five is a problem in the vehicle reserve with holding that money back from it with the general fund. Um, there, there are things we can do. Uh, we are looking at some policy changes in, 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 in monitoring our, our fleet replacement. Uh, that, that's an option. We think we can find some savings there over the next four or five years. Um, but it, it will be something we discuss in budget in, during the budget uh, process to, to, to restore at least some of that money back to the budget over the five year time frame to ensure that we're okay in, in the out years. But right now our thought process is we have an immediate need to, to resolve a, a, um, a working capital voice stream now and over the next, through our budget cycle, which I trust 100% in terms of resolving these problems, we would do that over the next over the next few budget cycles. Yeah, so whenever that happens, um, whenever that happens, we're going to be reaching out to our same taxpayers, many of whom who have lost their jobs, their businesses may have closed. And, you know, it might not be immediate, but years down the road, we're going to be asking them to replenish this fund. And... <laughs> If, if I could just jump in, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. Um, as Mr. Hewn indicated, if if we delay the transfer into the vehicle replacement fund, um, it causes a problem in the fifth year, five years from now. It gives us plenty of time to figure out what we want to do. Either we want to uh, reinstitute the, that fund balance, or perhaps it allows us an opportunity to change our model. Maybe we change how we look at our fleet replacement. Maybe we choose to uh, lease some vehicles rather than purchase some vehicles. So I think because we will then have time to address what happens five years from now in that fund, um, it allows us uh, some flexibility. So I don't know that it's an accurate statement to say that it will cost the taxpayers more. Um, I think what we would say is it allows us time to figure out the best solution. All right. Well, in my view, a transfer is not a savings. But to go on to the next question, just to move on, um, in your projection, you had the $10 million loss. Um, and you said that um, that assumed 100% back by the end of the year. Um, if we're not at 100% by the rest of the by uh, the end of the year, is it going to be more than a more than a $10 million loss? Could it be? Uh, that, that's correct. The, the, the $10 million is relates to the drop in revenue. Um, we, we, with the mitigation of not transferring the money, we have about a $6 million loss for a one-year recovery. However, Mr. You, you, you never project, you, you don't project the economy going back to 100% at all. This correct. So I correct. do that. Yeah. That's another, another statement that we just need to be clear on. His, his assumptions are not that we're dropping down March, April, and May and going back to 100% in the future. I think that V slide did show, it did show ultimately some projections, some forecasts of how long would it take to get back to the 100%. In reality, the numbers that we're working from, we only show at best going to 90 to 95%. Right, that, that chart was just kind of to give an illustrative view of, of, the, of the one to three year. We, we likely will not return to 100% uh, projections for a while. Okay, thank you. And then my last comment is, um, I believe I, I believe Normal's got a different model than a lot of the communities surrounding us because we have such a huge percentage of college students and we lost those students. So um, I just hope that in your model, which I don't need to get into the detail, that it reflects that, that we're very different than like, you know, in East Peoria or, you know, a Pontiac that doesn't have such a high concentration of students. So but thank I, you. I think the cogent point here is that we're looking at uh, projections uh, and and uh, best guesses going forward. We can't make any policy decisions or assumptions going forward until we get better data. And I think that's the point of what we're doing tonight is setting a baseline of where we are as a community and where we think we are. 
and and revisiting this likely with some policy decisions in July when we get hard numbers and, and really have a better idea of where we're going. Um, so at that point, I think we're going to close this out. Um, unless Ms. Reese or Mr. Hume, you've got anything else? Um, the only thing I'm going to ask is I'm going to ask um, Ms. Gataraju to step up and let us know if we're supposed to log off or just or just turn our um, video and audio off because they're going to um, I, the INT staff are going to fix the live stream feed and and so if, if Vasu could let us know what we're supposed to do, I just want to make yes. sure we're doing what they need. Absolutely. So right now, I think um, Zoom meeting, we can all stay here as is. I think the live stream will go down just for a little bit uh, for us to be able to fix that. I'll uh, get back to you in just a second on that one. So are we logging out and re-logging in? No, we can. Uh, you guys can all stay logged in. Um, it's just the live stream that will probably be down for a minute uh, before it, we can fix this. So okay. what right. you want to do is just, um, if we're going to take a quick break, you could just turn off your video feed and your audio feed and and, um, yes. and come back at whatever time Mayor Coos indicates. Uh, I'm going to say we come back. I have 6.59 right now. We'll come back at 7.10 with the Liquor Commission meeting. Okay. Thank you. That'll help. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, can we have some conversation so we can test our audio? Uh, can we have some conversations? So Mayor Koos, do you want to um, at least talk a little bit so we can one, see two, if audio is working on the live screen? One, two, three, four. Uh, hopefully we have audio and uh, visual working on this. Um, we would like to get started on this meeting as soon as we possibly can, though. Yep, we do have audio. Uh, audio is still small. We will fix that tomorrow, but audio is good. All right, I'm going to call to order a uh, special meeting for the normal local liquor commission. Please call the roll. Mayor Coos. Here. Mr. McCarthy. Here. Ms. Cummings. Here. Mr. Nord. Here. Ms. Smith. Here. Mrs. Lorenz. Here. Mr. Preston. Here. Uh, we have a uh, uh, <clears throat> request for three liquor licenses. Before we do that, I think we have somebody who would like to make comment. Is that correct? Uh, if you want to bring them in. Uh, yes. I'm admitting them now. And... Uh, is the person wishing to speak uh, last four number zero two eight two? Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. So if you'd state your name um, and uh, for the record, and I think you are the person who is uh, who has purchased these businesses. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, what? my name's Tyler Carl. Can you hear I me? Yeah, I can. Tyler, I'd like you to stay on, on, the, on the call uh, throughout this meeting if there are questions for you, but uh, in the Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Go right ahead. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, like I said, my name is Tyler Carlson, and then along with my wife, Brittany Carlson, and business partners, Russ and Lisa Moss, we own and operate MC1 Investments, LLC, which is the applicant um, for the agenda tonight. We uh, currently operate a successful restaurant located in Hayworth, Illinois, which has a primary focus on our handcrafted pizzas. And as we've looked to continue to expand our operation, we felt that it's a great opportunity to bring one of what we feel is the best pizza recipes in all of central Illinois to the town of Normal. Um, so uh, I, I will say I'm happy to stay on the meeting and answer any questions, but I just wanted to thank you guys for your time and consideration on granting us a liquor license and gaming license tonight. Um, I apologize for not being available um, last time, but uh, I will stay on this meeting and answer any questions that you guys may have. And we look forward to a great partnership with the town of Normal and 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 bring in what we feel is a really good menu and recipe to uh, to Normal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Day. Question for you. Yes, sir. Um, seeing is that this is the same business entity um, um, requesting the same licenses for three locations. Can we do these as one or do we have to do them individually? Uh, you could decide to do them by one vote if you so choose, unless anybody wants to separate them out. Um, everyone okay with that? Okay, so we have applications for uh, liquor license. Uh, MC1 Investments LLC doing business at Breeze Place in Landmark Plaza, Landmark at 1520 East College Avenue, in the Patriot Center at 115 Susan Drive Suite H, and in University Park, 1702 West College Avenue in Normal. The uh, recommended um, reapproval of a Class C liquor license and approval of video game licensing to this entity, uh, 35 years LLC. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, MC1 Investments LLC. Is that correct? Motion for approval. Move we'll approval. Second. Is there discussion on this? Hearing none, please call the roll. Mr. McCarthy. Aye. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Nord? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Aye. Mr. Preston? 
Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye, the liquor license is approved. Um, I got out of uh, order here. We also have approval of minutes of the special meeting of April 20th, 2020. Move approval. So, so move. Thank you. Yeah. Please call the roll. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Nord? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Aye. Mr. Preston? Aye. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye. The minutes are approved. Um, motion for adjournment. So moved. Move. Move. Second. Please call the roll. Mr. Nord? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Aye. Mr. Preston? Aye. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mayor Coos? All right, we are adjourned. Call to order the meeting for the normal town council for Monday, May 4th, 2020. Uh, please call the roll. Mayor Coos? Here. Mr. McCarthy? Here. Ms. Ms. Cummings? Here. Mr. Nord? Here. Ms. Smith? Here. Mrs. Lorenz? Here. Mr. Preston? Here. We will begin with a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we go to public comment. Do we have uh, commenters tonight? We do not. We have no commenters. So uh, go to the omnibus agenda. Um, items considered in routine in nature and will be handled with one vote. Um, unless a council member would like to pull an item for discussion. Move approval. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Please call the roll. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Ms. Cummings? Mr. Nord? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Mr. Preston? Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye. The omnibus agenda is approved. Uh, I kind of got out of order there to approve the regular meeting and a report to receive and file town of normal, normal expenditures for payment as of April 29th, 2020. Mayor, uh, I'm going to interrupt. It looks like Ms. Cummings is having trouble getting her. There you go. Yeah, and for some reason it wasn't working for a second there. <laughs> um, first item of general orders is an ordinance abating the town and library levy of the 2019 property tax for Rivian Automotive in accordance with the 2016 Economic Incentive Agreement. Move. Thank you. Moved by Mr. Uh, McCarthy and seconded, I think, by Mr. Uh, Ms. Ms. Lorenz. Mr. McCarthy. Um, yeah, I have. Obviously, it's a little bit of a Rivian theme um, tonight, but uh, I just wanted to open up and uh, the last time we talked about Rivian a little bit is um, being one of the folks around at that time is um, clearly, uh, as anybody of our citizens are watching, as I hope that we're warming up uh, that uh, Rivian is a real company and a real deal and uh, is very much interested in being a partner with our community. Um, uh, although uh, uh, there's a limited time tax break going on uh, for them, but as uh, their newspaper reporting and the plans of somewhere in the neighborhood of 750 million of investment at our plant and north of 300 and some jobs, I believe the uh, news report uh, gave us, I think this is a good, investment uh, in our partner um, 
bringing such good economic news when economic news has not been very good, as we all know. So uh, I'm supportive. I'm very happy that we, as a group, made the decision to support Rivian coming. Uh, I'm thrilled that they've decided uh, not to take us up on that million dollars and let that let us have that back for our budget when we certainly need it right now. And uh, so I'm very supportive of this. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Preston. Thanks, Mayor. Yep, I would um, also uh, suggest that I am certainly in support of uh, upholding our agreement per uh, this item, but also uh, find it important to echo uh, to Mr. Dietmeyer and to anyone else uh, from Rivian um, a thank you uh, for being such a uh, good community partner. Um, the uh, extension that you guys have offered um, by not seeking this uh, million dollar incentive um, is quite timely and it makes a difference to your home community here. Uh, so thank you very much for um, continuing to be a great partner for us and we look forward to um, supporting you and hire as many people as, uh, you know, hire as many people as you guys can. So thanks. And uh, I will remind council members again, when you're uh, done speaking or shortly thereafter, would you lower your hand? Because it gets hard for me to follow. Thank you. Ms. Smith. I, yes, um, thank you. Um, with the advantage of having Mr. Dietmeyer here for Rivian, if he could speak to uh, the plans, act, the plants activity during the stay-at-home orders, um, how it had impacted the facility, and um, what actions they might have been able to employ, and also um, for those of us who weren't involved in the council directly. Could, could we have a refresher on all of the taxing bodies that were involved in this original abatement? Because I, I know we're voting tonight, but I'm not familiar with the other bodies that were in agreement with this. I would ask uh, Ms. Reese um, to answer those questions. Uh, no disrespect, Mr. Dietmeyer, but we're at the point where we're at a council discussion and uh, I don't think we want to get into broader issues. We we really need to stick to the issue of the rebate tonight. Certainly. Um, thank you, Mayor. In, in regard to the taxing bodies that are part of this agreement, um, it includes the town normal, of course, Heartland Community College, Unit 5 School District, um, McLean County, um, Central Illinois, let's see, Bloomington uh, Normal Airport Authority, so basically Central Illinois Regional Airport, and the Bloomington Normal Water Reclamation District. And I'm going to ask Mr. Hoban if I missed anyone. I, I think that I covered. I think they covered got them all. Okay. So, thank you. And in regard to um, Rivian's activities during this uh, pandemic, I, I can't respond to that. Um, Ms. Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to take this moment to certainly thank um, Rivian and, uh, well, Zach, especially um, as you speak on behalf tonight of Rivian, um, shows what we can accomplish when we continue to partner with our businesses and our community. Um, and I think, you know, it's something that that can be also looked at not just locally, but you know, across our state and nationally, how communities can partner with um, the businesses within their community and how they can be beneficial on both sides. And this is, you know, this is really great news to hear. Um, you know, we took the the step and made the investment, um, and you know, you recognize that. And in return, at at this dire time. Um, you were willing to make an investment back into the community that you've come into to um, build your business in. So we certainly appreciate that. We look to continue to keep a partnership um, on, on a go forward uh, basis. So thank you so much. And we are glad that you're here. Um, Mr. Nord. Um, I too wanna thank Rivian for um, rebating the million dollars back it definitely it's is something that is very timely and you know our citizens appreciate it um 
I was not a part of this decision whenever the um, incentive was first given. So I'm kind of at a loss as to what the intentions were. Um, I started to watch some of the council video from that night and I didn't make it through the entire video, but I saw the first part where the presentation was going on. And uh, <clears throat> um, there was a lot of talk of bringing jobs to the community. And even um, Mr. Scringe, I believe I got that pronunciation right, had mentioned that he has to report to his board of directors and his shareholders. And, you know, some we have to do the same thing. We have to report back to the our shareholders or the citizens. And uh, the question that I have of the council that was here whenever this decision was made was um, the jobs. Um, I had asked Ms. Reese if um, Rivian had reported that they had 75 jobs um, that they were paying people if they were their, their employees and she did not have that data. Um, it's obvious that there's a lot of work going on there and that they probably have well more than enough people out there working. But the agreement was that there were 75 um, full-time employees. And my question to the, to the council members that were there before, was it your intention that those employees were full-time new Rivian employees or was it inclusive of any contractors doing bid out? the uh, the uh, build out because that's really where I'm at is did they meet the performance goal or not and you have to answer that um if I could jump in Mr. Nord thank you um uh I have Mr. Hoban on the line who has sent the letter to each of the taxing bodies affirming that Rivian has met their uh, performance criteria in order to be eligible for the tax rebate um, we are not, I can, I can tell council and, that, and the public that we don't count contractors as Rivian employees. They actually have to be Rivian employees to be counted as Rivian employees. So I, will do, I, I would just recommend that we defer um, that issue to Mr. Hoban, if, if Mayor Coos is okay with that. Mr. Hoban. Uh, yes. I think the question is, uh, they had a milestone of 75 workers and you can probably address whether they did that or not. Definitely. Uh, we worked with Rivian um, and our HR department to uh, map out actually 193 full-time Rivian employees, not contractors. So that's how many they had. Um, we actually have their IDs, their titles, um, how much they make, uh, because it wasn't just a requirement that they had to be full-time, uh, but they also had to exceed the um, average wage, weekly wage in uh, Bloomington Normal, and they crushed it. Um, so th these aren't just a matter of beating 75 jobs. They're, they're making more um, than, than we ever expected as well. Good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you, Rivian. And I'm sorry that I threw a little bit of water on the parade, but it's my job. It's my duty. It's, my, it's the oath I took. So thank you. Then I will. Um, did I? Um, I did, Ms. Lorenz. Again, folks, could you hang up when you, uh, can you lower your hand? It makes my job difficult. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I, I want to echo what's already been said about um, gratitude towards Rivian coming to our community, certainly with their gesture of being already a great corporate citizen in so far as um, the $1 million return back to the community. I think that speaks volumes to the type of organization they are. And I just want to really reiterate and remind us all that, you know, when a company like Arivian comes to a community, they have a lot of other communities that they can choose to go to. And so, um, you know, this is a national, if not a global competition when it comes to attracting um, good paying jobs, good corporations to call your town home. And, um, you know, I just was really struck by something in the letter that was very encouraging in so far as um, the statement about being their, mot their motto being adventure is forever. Um, they put a different twist on that for their view and their relationship with normal being adventurous together. And I think that relationship and that partnership is key. It's been key since 2016 and um, it's key going forward. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Further on the item? 
Please call the roll. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Nord? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Aye. Mr. Preston? Aye. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye. The motion is approved. Uh, Mr. Norton, would you lower your hand, please? Um, item eight is a resolution authorizing the renewal of the town's participation in, in the Municipal Insurance Cooperative Agency, better known as MICA. Uh, the insurance program for plan year 2020-2021, beginning May 1st, 2020. I move this, this item. Thank you. Discussion on this item? Uh, yeah. Yes, please. Um, I had sent some questions to Ms. Reese uh, about this particular insurance arrangement um, because I noted that in the documentation, it indicated that uh, this particular arrangement incorporates the fact that the participants partially self-insure and um, she was kind enough to respond back in, um, and affirm that while there are some commercial carriers that can accommodate that, there were some unique properties that uh, enhance the relationship with MICA. And if, if um, in addition to giving the, the numbers um, in the contract that was approved, if she could please speak to the advantages this particular agreement has, because it does act, I believe, as a consortium. Um, thank you, Ms. Smith. I can, but actually a better respondent would be our finance director, Andrew Hewn. Andrew serves on the board of MICA, the cooperative, on, and represents the town on that board. And so I'll let him uh, give a quick summary of the, the MICA coverage and what that organization does. Certainly, yeah, you're correct. It's, uh, it's a cooperative, um, so it serves as a risk pool. So we have 22 organizations um, that are on, that are members of MICA. Uh, most of them are municipalities, uh, range from, from our size and, and maybe a little bit bigger to very small cities and towns, uh, some water districts and so forth. Um, the, MICA was formed about 30 years ago uh, as a risk pool to help municipalities and local governments uh, better insure themselves against various losses, workers' compensation, um, plant property equipment, auto, uh, crime, cyber crime, general liability. Uh, the, the market's always very volatile in terms of what's going on. Uh, with the risk pool, we share the, the losses among all of us uh, and also share the gains. Um, so we're basically spread, we're, we're coming to the market with a, a much bigger portfolio of users uh, that gives us the opportunity to get better competitive pricing from the commercial carriers. Uh, it is a self-funded plan to a certain degree. So by way of example, um, for a auto liability um, or a general liability, uh, the, the town member pays an annual rate and then it's basically you paid your insurance. After that point in time, MICA self-funds itself to a certain level. And then at a certain point in time, if the, the claim exceeds a certain level of dollars, uh, it's, it's done uh, by reinsurance that carry takes over. And we pay for that also. So we fund a loss fund to pay the self-insurance for all MICA claims, no matter what member contributes that claim. And if it exceeds a certain value, then insurance kicks in to cover that. And um, if I was reading the documentation correctly, based on our town's experience, we might have experienced a rate increase, but because we were part of this pool, um, the actual increase in premium, um, was there an increase in premium or was there actually a reduction in expense? Uh, we did have, an, where there was a small overall increase in the total MICA premium for all, all members. And then that, that premium is spread among all the members based on a couple of different formulas. They're fairly complicated, but they break down essentially as being how big you are in terms of how many, what your asset portfolio is. Uh, and then also what your experience has been in terms of losses over a four-year period. Um, so they, they mix that together and we, they basically, of course, we basically apportion off the premium charge to all the members based on that experience and how big you are. And that changes over time. Um, as your experience goes up in terms of your, your 
you're contributing more losses to the pool, you'll pay a little more. And we've had several years of, of pretty good um, uh, losses years ago. A couple, we've had a couple, you know, that have pushed up our loss ratio a little bit. So we did have an increase this year. Uh, the nice thing about the pool is the pool will, will limit your increase or decrease by 10%. Um, so that, that helps us do some budget planning. If we, were, we would experience a lot more of a volatile rate increase or decrease, depending on what we're going, what's going on, because we're not sharing our losses with, with other members. Um, so the pool works well for us. Uh, we do get pretty competitive rates as a pool itself, uh, but then we are evaluated as, as a member uh, in terms of our size and loss, loss or lack of loss or, or increased losses. And then we're assigned an ultimate rate from the pool for that insurance. Um, several several of us went up this year. Um, several went down. It changes every single year. We've had several years where we actually had decreases. Uh, this year, we did have an increase. So that is all I had. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, further on this item, please call the roll. Mr. Nord. Aye. Ms. Smith. Aye. Mrs. Lorenz. Aye. Mr. Preston. Aye. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye. The resolution is approved. Item 9 is a resolution accepting the low bid and awarding a contract to American Litho of Milwaukee, Wisconsin for the printing of the Parks and Recreation Department's fall, winter, and spring and summer activity guides in the amount of $31,675. Move approval. Second. Second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Preston. And uh, just to, before we go into the discussion, um, this is for the fall and winter of 2020 and the spring and summer of 2021. Is that correct? That is correct, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Preston? Did you uh, yeah, I did. Um, about this particular topic and the question was, I guess the request, if you can kind of explain to people um, what happens if this mailer comes out and there's a lot of um, programs that we can no longer do because of this whole pandemic um, and what the, what the plan is so uh, people can be notified of any changes, at least for the first season that's, that this is gonna be printed. Or um, I have actually asked uh, um, Parks and Recreation Director Doug Damry to participate in the call since this is his agenda item. So I will let Doug respond to that because the, the next brochure to be printed um, under this contract should council approve it would be the fall brochure. Mr. Damry? Yes. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay. Um, so actually um, we're... We're dealing with that that issue right now. Uh, the summer brochure came out in uh, the uh, well it was printed at the beginning of March, uh, and then um, of course now we're dealing with uh, modifications and changes in programming. So uh, what we've been doing is we've been tr uh, communicating directly with any participants that have already signed up for any programming uh, directly through our recreation program supervisors and dealing with each. Uh, case individually. And then we're also um, uh, communicating through all of our website. We're making changes to the online activity guide to make sure that those changes are updated as we know them, uh, which obviously is very challenging right now as we are changing every day based on what we're finding out and what we can decide on. So, um, and then we've also been doing it through our e-blast, social media, and on, on the website as well. So, that's how we'll continue to do it. The, the, the nice thing is for the fall brochure, uh, I think we'll have a better handle on, on what kind of changes to anticipate and uh, be able to, to sort of better predict those, those modifications that we need to make to programming. Um, obviously the beginning of summer will tell a lot in what fall would probably look like or where it might, how close to normal we might get as far as our programming goes. And uh, we have some time, we've moved actually our deadline uh, for when we will print the fall guide back a couple weeks to give us a little bit more time to to find out what that will look like so that midsummer when we start to do our fall programming, we'll have a better idea of what we might be dealing with. And of course, we have until mid-July before we start to finalize those things. So 
I think we have some time to before we get into all that. So uh, feel comfortable with where we're at right now, and we can make some changes if we have to. Okay, thank you. Um, as far as your programs, especially like the youth programs, mm -hmm. there are so many families here. You know, these are the the families that live here year in, year out. They don't go home for the summer. They use these programs. Um, my son loves the peewee basketball and things like that. So it's going to break my heart when the program comes out and we can't do these things. It's going to break my kid's heart. And there's so many families like that. So what you do, you may not get as much appreciation, possibly, but people do appreciate all the programs you do. So thank you. Yeah, well, we are trying to do what we can to offer whatever we can. So we're, we're making changes and modifications so that anticipating limitations and potential, you know, uh, social distancing, as well as the large groups, as well as uh, health and safety. So we're going to try to make whatever changes we can and safely provide those programs. Yeah. And I'm sure kids would, would, well, they probably wouldn't listen too well, but parents would appreciate if there's any changes that can be done to allow them to at least interact a little bit and get out of the house and interact with, with their friends and other kids. So yeah. thank you. And um, one last question is um, this wouldn't have been as big of an issue a month ago as it is now, but the vendor we're using is out of the area. In light of what's happened, are there any vendors nearby that maybe we can direct our dollars to be used to help local businesses? Um, well, uh, I don't believe we received any locally that any bids locally. Uh, well, I know we did. We Astoria, uh, Illinois was uh, where KK Stevens was. That's been the printer we've used the last couple of years. Um, and then the, another one, Martin One Source from Champaign, Illinois. So, um, you know, they, they were quite a bit higher. So um, from a budgetary standpoint, I think we've got the, the best uh, responsible, lowest responsible bidder. Would it, would it, would it uh, throw anything off if we sent out a request and maybe made this decision next week? Because maybe they've been impacted enough where, where they just need any type of work. Mr. Nord, the problem with that is, is we had a, a bid window and the window closed and all the bidders have shown their hand. Um, uh, I think we put ourselves in, in a position of uh, being litigated on this issue. Uh, policy is once the bids close, that's it. It's something we can reach out to people uh, going forward and say, please bid on this, on these items. But to uh, reopen the bid, I think uh, is unfair to the, to the people who bid on it. Further on this item, please call the roll. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Aye. Mr. Preston? Aye. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Nord? Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye. The resolution is approved. Item 10 is a resolution authorizing to execute a three-year contract with Coney Incorporated for uh, elevator maintenance services for a fixed annual cost of $27,850. Could I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Discussion on this item? Mr. Nord, I think your hand's up from the last one. Are, are you wishing to, thank you. No. Uh, please call the roll. Mrs. Lorenz? Aye. Mr. Preston? Aye. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Nord? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye. The resolution is approved. Item 11 is a resolution to accept bids and award a contract to Row Construction, a division of United Contractors Midwest, for the Belt Avenue Bridge resurfacing in the amount of $46,529.42. Move approval. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Discussion on this item. Please call the roll. Mr. Preston? Aye. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Nord? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Aye. Mayor Kuth? Aye. 
The res that resolution is approved. Item 12 is a resolution authorizing a contract with Hair Construction for the 2020 sanitary sewer lining contract in the amount of $452,149.80. Motion to approve. Thank you. Discussion on this item. Um, I'll take a. Uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Lorenz and then Mr. Nord. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just had a couple of things I wanted to point out and perhaps then a question to um, either Ms. Reese or, or Mr. Aldridge. Um, this is a uh, an estimate, a pretty, pretty large, it's like pretty large project, 8,400 feet of some linear feet of lining. Um, eight or 10 or so areas in our community. So that's great. Um, this is part of our pay as you go capital improvement that we tuck away money in our sanitary sewer fund for. Um, and I noticed that um, Crawford, Murphy and Tilly prepared the, the project. This is the question. Did they actually prepare, Were they was part of their scope to prepare the estimate as well? Um, Ms. Lorenz, I will ask um, Public Works Director Wayne Aldrich, who is on the call, to unmute and perhaps there he is, now we can see him, and he can respond to your questions regarding the, the design and Crawford Mercy Tilly's uh, uh, project cost estimate. Yeah, so that, that is correct. We do rely on our consultants to prepare the engineer's estimate. Um, that estimate's based on past contracts that, that they've seen. And we, we review that as well. So um, uh, I think one thing that uh, may have thrown them in with the 24 inch sanitary sewer, I think they put a higher price to that. And that's um, a considerable amount of this particular contract. And so the contractor, you know, um, underbid that item, you know, so, uh, you know, there's several other things that are happening right now, including the COVID crisis that that may be driving these prices down. Uh, we've also seen increasing competition over the last several years in this type of work. And also this type of work is becoming more popular uh, in most communities. Uh, so, so I think, again, there's more competition and the material prices may also be coming down. So uh, following this, we'll have a long conversation with our consultants and project managers and and kind of do a quality review of our, our uh, cost estimating and as we move forward. Thank you. That you actually answered my follow-up question is, you know, if any, um, would, would you consider doing to modify the processes for estimating? And you, you just answered it there. Um, to that end, you know, I can't recall in my five years now on council where we've had not only one, but now two major capital projects that have come in significantly under budget, which, you know, should be cause for celebration, but in the category of no good deed goes unpunished, you know, then of course it, it raises some questions just in and of itself. So I'm glad to hear that um, you recognize that and we'll work with our um, um, engineering firms who are professional engineers themselves. I'll add to that that um, it's also uh, more reassuring that the contractor that won this is a known entity to us. We know we know this company, uh, Mr. Nord. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Lorenz. That's those are that's the point that I was going to be talking about because um, I had some constituents have the same the same concerns. Um, another concern is. Um, if we've got these two back to back, there possibly may, may be more going forward. So what we've budgeted for expenses, you know, very likely could be significantly different than what we actually experience. And any of these savings that we have, um, I would like to see those savings be transferred immediately to reserves because we know we're going to start eating into these reserves. Um, so I'd like to hear from other council members to get their input on that. Uh, so I will entertain um, if you feel that we should take these dollars and immediately put them in reserves. The issue is to put it in a general fund reserve violates a policy. It, it can go into the sewer fund reserve. 
uh, which is where it will be added back. And I see Ms. Reese wanting to speak on this issue. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I did just want to point out um, that the projects, this project affects the sewer fund. The, mo the previous project is the water fund. Um, people, in, in fact, I think consumption with stay at home is actually up. Um, so people are continuing to use the utilities. So um, you know, the, the water and sewer utilities are certainly very different than the general fund. So when we talk about um, water and sewer needing the reserves, that is always the case. We always want a strong reserve in our utilities, but it is very different than the general fund that we referred to earlier in our work session. So what happens to this essentially surplus? Where does it go? Uh, I think we, we addressed this in the last council meeting. When there are uh, savings in the water fund and the sewer fund, they stay in those appropriate funds, and they can either be allocated to other capital investments, because as we've discussed in the past, um, the need for maintaining and um, investing in our underground infrastructure, which is our water pipes and our sewer pipes, um, never stops. So we can continue to invest in the system like we have for a number of years, or we can hold those funds in reserve, um, but they stay in those utility accounts. And because these dollars were budgeted, um, if we don't use them, will they be available for next year without council approval? Or do we have to do something to ensure that these funds are not used without further council action? Uh, this too, I think was addressed last council meeting with the last project, but it's worth mentioning again, that funds are expended um, per the procurement policy. So if the funds that retain are retained in the water fund and the sewer fund, those dollars from these savings stay in those accounts. Um, if we choose to invest them in the system and do a capital project, then it's a project that would be bid out. But first of all, it would be designed, it, designed, it would be bid out, and it would be project be brought to council for approval, um, just like any other uh, major project. Okay, thank you. And just like the last year that water and sewer rates went up, we now have almost a million dollars of savings. So I urge that we do not go forward with our water and sewer rate increase, but thank you. And thank you for finding the savings. Uh, Mr. McCarthy. And again, just a reminder to lower your hand. Will do. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm uh, happy to underline Ms. Lorenz's point that we've uh, found the savings. And I guess I'll go uh, in reverse order. I mean, I look at this as, you know, seven plus years now in the council. There's never a shortage of uh, very expensive sewer projects, or even, you know, we've bled into the last conversation about water projects. There's never a shortage of very expensive water projects. Uh, uh, two main breaks on my street alone in the last uh, few months. Uh, crews out here in the dark of night fixing that are very, very costly. Uh, that's the worst case scenario for us from a cost perspective. Same thing with sewer. Um, and so I guess I just wanted a couple comments. That last one, uh, uh, was on my list was uh, um, by saving this money, we get to fund more projects and get more uh, projects done for our taxpayers using the same amount of dollars. So we're stretching our taxpayers' dollars as best we can, getting the best bang for a buck. So uh, uh, Mr. Aldridge, you and your team, if you can keep finding these low bids for this, please do, because uh, you're helping our taxpayers out tremendously and greatly appreciate that. Um, I just zoom the lens up for a little bit for those who have been on council. Uh, for a while, um, pre-sewer uh, master plan is that we've gone from very low resources, uh, not not very much on our fund at all, to now not only money to fix the emergency problems, but now we're in a position where proactively addressing aging infrastructure before it breaks. And that is a great way to save taxpayer money is by not waiting till it's emergency and has to be repaired at the most highest rates with the highest, most expensive equipment. And so, and we're doing that with a system 
that lowers our investment cost in that aging infrastructure. So we're fixing it before it broke, broken, saving taxpayer dollars, and we're using a method that extends the useful life, also saving taxpayers money. So I greatly appreciate what Mr. Aldridge is doing uh, and uh, the team and following the sewer master plan and, and finding good solutions. But I also want to say thanks to the to the council that was on at the time and approved the master plan and everybody on the council that continues to support the sewer master plan by funding it because this is a direct use of those fees going to invest before really costly repairs happen. And in the long run, we're saving taxpayer money by this. So thanks everybody, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, yes, and Mr. Aldridge, in um, corresponding with Ms. Reese about this project, uh, I understand this was part originally of a five-year master plan. And in accounting, we talk about percentage of completion. And it's my understanding that this was originally a five-year proposal addressing the uh, sewers in the original um, model that we were looking at for budgeting these sewer repairs and the sewer lining, where do we stand on the that five-year time frame? So, uh, yeah, this was a five-year program as uh, set forth in the sewer master plan. Uh, I would say we're probably about sixty percent complete. We've been been into this plan for a couple of years now, and I think this will be our third year. So, uh, we're probably about sixty percent complete with the sewer linings that were originally envisioned. And again, those original sewer linings were problem areas that we knew about at the time. Uh, the other major thing we're doing right now is um, televising and rating all of our sewers in town. So that was another master plan uh, project to be completed in five years. We think uh, in combination with contractors and our own sewer crews, we can complete that ahead of schedule. So we're on a three to four year plan with televising and assessing our sewers. So uh, we didn't envision just stopping after five years. We envisioned uh, reassessing the system after a certain number of years uh, and then uh, continuing it with the program, especially in lining projects and manhole rehabilitations and pump station projects, things like that. So uh, the way I, I think we uh, projected to move forward was after these sewer assessments were complete, having that that full picture of the system, then going through and rating the sewers and then actually developing a new plan for a priority plan for uh, the sewer system going forward. So I envisioned that either in the CIP or in other doc in the budget document or a revision of the sanitary sewer plan uh, with these sewer projects in the future. And um, thank you, Mr. Aldridge and Mr. Mayor. I, I appreciate your indulging me in going a little bit off topic of this particular uh, line item on the agenda, but reinforcing the value of that while we have these savings, it provides us with the ability to continue to be proactive, not just now, but in our future plans to maintain uh, our systems. Thank you. Quite well taken, Ms. Smith. Ms. Lorenz. Yes, thank you for another opportunity to speak. Um, I, I want to make sure that um, for the sake of discussion here, that what we're talking about, and particularly to Councilmember Nord's point of um, the, the two back-to-back -back savings that amount up to a little over $800,000. That was about $450,000 savings for the water fund capital and now about 380,000 in the sewer fund, two separate funds. Um, both of these savings are happening in their respective capital uh, funds, big projects, one-time projects. Um, for the sake of, of, of the argument that I think Mr. Nord is suggesting, you know, moving those capital funds into what would be operational funds to potentially avoid um, the rate increase that we talked about and, and approved earlier for the water fund, that is, um, has some consequences. Um, 
the consequences are, are to the points that I think a couple of you have already been saying, and that if you were to take funds out of the capital, which to me is kind of like your savings account and putting it into the operational, which to me is like a checking account, um, you short change in the long run, in the not so long run, the ability to pay as you go for large capital projects. And so you're faced with either not doing it uh, and deferring it um, or seeking a loan to, to get the project done and also not being able to respond in the event of, um, of an emergency. So if, if, if the idea of, of shifting funds from capital to operational sounds satisfying and enticing now, I urge us to think about the, um, the long run that would shortchange us on the, uh, on the overall infrastructure, which gets to the points that uh, Ms. Smith and I think Mr. McCarthy and, and others have been saying. Further on this item, please call the roll. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Nord? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Mr. Preston? Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye. The resolution is approved. Uh, before going on to the next one, Ms. Lorenz, would you lower your hand? Thank you. Uh, item 13 is a resolution conditionally approving a final plat for the item subdivision by expedited process approving an easement vacation and accepting an easement dedication. Properties at 105 through 111 West Locust. Motion for approval. Move. So moved. Thank you. Discussion on this item. Please call the roll. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Nord? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Aye. Mr. Preston? Aye. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye. The res that resolution is approved. We have one item of new business, a motion to initiate a zoning text amendment pertaining to section 15.9-17 C-1 multiple use office park, have, uh, better known as one normal plaza planned unit development. We have approval. Thank you. Second. Um, I'll just make the briefest comment on this. Uh, this is a uh, something that we do uh, to update planned unit developments uh, to make them more relevant to the to today's market, changing some of the um, the uh, suggested uses in in that planned unit development, and that's what this process is all about. Mr. McCarthy, you led with a motion for approval. Do you have a comment? Sure. Um, excitement mostly. Uh, I know we're not putting any money or investing or doing anything of that, which is good. But, um, you know, in the couple of campaigns uh, I've done and being out talking to constituents in that area, they've always talked consistently about wanting to see more done over there in balance. Um, but I want to um, thank staff for uh, really investing a fair amount of time to collect uh, residents' input on that project. I think it's a, it is a delicate balance out there, and and that's what I've always heard when I've been out walking around talking to neighbors out there. And so um, I think that's a really great step to show that neighborhood that uh, we're listening and and we care. And uh, it's very interesting that proposed business owners were out there were listening as well. So. Uh, I just, I'm excited about some uh, future development out there. I know we don't really have much to do with that other than zoning, but uh, um, I'm glad we're listening too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no more requests, please call the roll. Oh, Mr. Nord. Uh, oh, Mr. Nord uh, jumped in. Mr. Nord. Yeah, um, sorry about that. I don't know what happened, but uh, <clears throat> a couple of concerns that I have. Um, We've been emailing back and forth with Ms. Reese since we first found out about this. And what concerns me is the optics of this. Um, it seems like we're missing a step. Zoning is what we're changing. 
And this should start and go through the um, planning commission. This is what their function is. Um, the owners of this property, they are into the normal town government, you know, and they both are, well, they both have municipal positions. So the optics that we're skipping a step, I think is not, is not good. You know, this should start at a lower level and they should recommend to us if this is worthwhile to do, they should vet these issues. Um, Ms. Reese had said that staff has spent possibly 40 hours talking to businesses and residents. Um, I'm not sure if that's normal, but it seems to me like this should have started with the developer putting effort in and doing this because are we going to be skipping a step now of um, having a formal conversation with the residents so that way all the information is recorded and documented? Um, that's my big concern is just the optics around this. Um, and if council initiates this action, by council initiating it, we give the presumption to staff, the public, and whoever is looking at this, that this is something that council supports. And honestly, we don't even know the information that's going to be coming from this and what the community says. When I first saw it, I had lots of safety concerns. Um, about what's going in there. So I just think the, opti the optics are, are, are very bad that we're skipping a step because these people are, in, are, are somehow connected. Um, thank you, Mr. Nord. Um, Mayor Chris, if it's, if it's all right, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, uh, in regard to the optics, I guess it, it is an opportunity for council to clarify that then because what we are in fact doing is initiating this into a public process. So this certainly becomes a very transparent process where we seek public input. Um, we, we allow the planning commission to lead that public uh, process and then return to you with a recommendation. So this is a very common step in terms of zoning code modifications. Um, the other thing I'll mention though, in terms of staff time, for staff to put uh, 40 plus or minus hours into a zoning related project is not unique. Most developers require a lot of staff time, even if they were to initiate the um, zoning matter. Um, there are projects that have been um, on our plates for years on end and some that maybe just the last few months, but also require a lot of staff time. So. Um, each development is different. Each opportunity is different. Some developers um, require much more handholding and guidance from staff. So um, we are just pleased that this is an opportunity to reconsider what the One Normal Plaza PUD could look like moving forward into the future. So um, if council has specific questions about uh, this action tonight, I did ask uh, town planner Mercy Davison and um, also Greg Trummel from Building Inspections to, to be prepared to answer any questions council may have. Yep. Ms. Lorenz. Ms. Lorenz, the floor is yours. There we go. Sometimes the space bar work and sometimes it does not. Um, thank you. This is where um, I'll just say that having experience serving on the planning commission or, or any of the other commissions really is invaluable um, when you're sitting in this seat now, because this is not circumventing anything, Mr. Nord. In fact, this is the beginning of that very transparent process that is about ready to start. Um, with that, I think I will yield my time to Ms. Davison and Mr. Trammell who know that process inside and out. Well, let's uh, not go into the process unless there are specific questions from council. Um, are there questions for council? Mr. McCarthy, you now have the floor. Thanks, Mayor. Just a little further on this is if I'm calling staff, whoever's appropriate to answer this question, but if I recall correctly, this is 
pretty precisely how the uptown code uh, change process to get us to uptown design standards. And, and we saw a need, needed to update the code to meet a contemporary potential opportunity. So we evolved code to stimulate opportunity and went through this whole process. Am I, am I remembering that correctly? I was on the citizen side, wasn't on the council when all that happened, but I remember reading about it. So if you could comment, that'd be great. I'll uh, defer to uh, Pam Planner Mercy Davison. Um, thank you, Pam. Um, so it is not uncommon for staff to take this sort of route to the public process. Um, occasionally we'll have a member of the public ask us about changing the zoning code for something that's really minor, maybe it's complicated, but it, it really doesn't fit into our bigger vision. And we don't hesitate to tell that person that's really not, that's not really where we're going. Like it's not supported by any plan that we have. It's not supported by direction we've gotten from council. So it's not like we just spend a lot of staff time anytime anyone comes to us with a request. Um, with One Normal Plaza though, off and on over the years, we've talked about how it is a under, it's an underappreciated community asset. And in fact, in the most recent comprehensive plan, it's specifically cited as an area that would merit a lot more focused study, investigation, et cetera. Now you can hire a, a, a consulting firm to come in and do that work for you. And it, it would be amazing and it would be quite expensive and would certainly go beyond what staff could do in the normal course of business. But I think what we've been able to accomplish with this first step is a really good in-depth analysis of what's going on out there, what the potential uh, has, uh, what, what potential is in store out there. Um, we have a lot of local knowledge, there are interested property owners out there who've expressed their interest. So you kind of have a lot of factors coming together that supported staff running with this a little bit. And I mean, we went out of our way to make sure that the property, every single property owner within One Normal Plaza was aware pretty much from the beginning that we were thinking about this and that we wanted their input, that there would be a uh, kind of a pre-game opportunity to give us some early input and then a very formal, very open process to give give your input again. Maybe it will be the same, maybe it will evolve. Um, in addition to for everybody who owns property within 400 feet will be noticed about this. So, you know, there's the pre-formal process that involves a lot of input from property owners. And then again, we'll have a lot more opportunity in the coming weeks. So we feel really good about the amount of engagement we've had thus far and, and no doors have been closed yet, not even closed. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Nord. Um, since you're asking us to start this process, I had uh, asked Ms. Reese about some safety concerns um, mm -hmm. because it's there's gonna be a brewery there, which I assume then they're gonna have big trucks coming through there. And, um, People will probably be drinking. I'm assuming they're going to be asking for a liquor license. Well, there's the uh, big park that's there. There's a lot of children's activities, a daycare, um, a kid's swimming area. The um, town has got the activity center that's there. Um, those roads going in there are all very tight. And people park on the sides of the street. Kids are going in and out of the cars. And I don't know if you have kids, but they're not great about staying close to the car and you know, in that in that tight area, I just see all these safety concerns that if I were to recommend someone to start looking at something, these were things, these, these would be things that I would need to know ahead of time. How are they going to be addressed before I could say I supported something or not? And that's where I think we're missing that step. How do you address? How do you address that concern? So, Mr. Nord, um, the public process would be a perfect opportunity to start talking about those concerns. In speaking with the property owners, that issue did come up um, with a couple of owners for sure. And um, we talked about how, yes, there are design techniques you can use if traffic safety becomes an issue. You do have to, to some degree, you have to figure out what issues may arise. Um, by no means is uh, your initiating this process, does that mean that a microbrewery will absolutely be approved. That's one of the items on the table. And so that's part of this public process. Now, if a microbrewery were an approved type of use in this area, we would talk about what kind of traffic would it generate and what sorts of delivery vehicles. 
at the scale of operation that we are talking about for any type of land use in one normal plaza, the idea that you would require like interstate size trucks shouldn't really be part of the mix. Um, but it's again, it's part of this this public conversation. Um, the very nature of the way one normal plaza is laid out already lends itself to fairly low traffic speeds. And that's a good thing because really the issue with traffic safety is the speed of vehicles. Um, but it's something we can absolutely look at through this process. Okay. Um, it, well, my last point is um, according to the planning commissions, I guess their website, they say that their responsibility, their duty is to recommend to the town council concerning revisions to ordinances in regarding to subdivision and zoning and in addition to revisions to the zoning map, this is exactly what they should be doing. Our body, the council body, is a policy setting body. This is not setting policy. This is asking staff to do something that normally the planning commission should be presenting to us. And for that reason, I just, I just, I just can't support it. Take this through the planning commission, bring it up to council, and then, you know, we can support, or then, then I would support it. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cummings. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I really want to speak to this because this is not a new conversation. I don't know if some people caught insomnia or what. This is kind of a relatively old conversation, and I live in the area, um, and we've talked about how do we build this, this particular space it up? How do we actually get full utilization because it's not currently being utilized? Um, you know, there is no, at this, excuse me, at the time, there's a 100% guarantee what will specifically be there. But I do believe um, approving the PUD will allow us to in the zoning and what it can be used for. Um, and so from, once again, being a resident who actually lives in the area, I look forward to seeing what we can make of it and how we can utilize it and make it better. Thank you. Mr. Preston. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just for clarity of process here, I'd like to uh, take a minute and just read a couple sentences that are in our packet um, discussing the public process for this. Um, it, uh, the information says, if the town council moves to initiate this zoning text amendment, town staff will file the item for publication so that it can be placed on the June 4th agenda of the planning commission for a public hearing. The commission will take public testimony and will make a recommendation on the proposed zoning text amendment, which may or may not include changes from what town staff is proposing. Presuming the planning commission does not carry the item over for additional public hearings, the item will then return to the council for final approval on June 15 at the earliest. And um, just to kind of outline, because there's been some questions as to how this process works, what, uh, you know, uh, what planning commission's role in this is, wanted to make sure it's understood for anybody watching that uh, by taking this action, we are not circumventing the planning commission. It's actually starting a process that will then shoot it over uh, to planning as, uh, as, you know, happens every time. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, yes, thank you. And, and, I, I confess I'm showing my ignorance and and not having the experience Ms. Lorenz brought to the council when when she came on board. But my understanding then is that we are looking at drafting some language to provide a roadmap for what could happen on this acreage. But by, we're by no means uh, is it a foregone conclusion that any of the ideas that are under discussion are gaining any. Uh, advantage by doing this, as they come to fruition, they would still re be required to come before zoning for approval and the regular process. Am, am I stating that accurately? Yes, you are. Oh, well, thank you, Jesus. Okay. Thank you. Um, please call the roll. Mr. Nord. Nay. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Aye. Mr. Preston? Aye. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Ms. Cummings? 
Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye. The resolution is approved. And before we go to adjournment, uh, concerns or comments, and you all need to lower your hands so I can see who is fresh on this. Mr. Preston. Thank you. Just uh, just one, um, in light of the uh, pandemic going on, I wanted to give a um, special uh, shout out to a former mayor of mine, but who lives in Normal, who is uh, making masks. And um, I just got an ISU one that I purchased from her and figured that was, you know, worth drawing attention to. Um, and uh, it's something that I wore when I went out earlier today and got, uh, got a nice compliment on uh, so thanks to the neighbor who did it, uh, and uh, glad to have it. I wasn't prepared to show you my bicycle mask that somebody made me today, Mr. Preston, but you you, uh, you got one on me there. Uh, uh, Ms. Reese. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to publicly uh, recognize the town normal employees. I had shared with the city council that the town employees Philanthropy group had uh, collected not only funds from all town employees, but also um, quite a variety of supplies. They, they held a baby drive and collected supplies all from town employees, um, so much so that it filled the pickup truck. And we delivered a pickup truck of supplies to the baby fold. And I just think it's really neat. The baby fold. Uh, thank the town through their social media, and I had shared this information with council, but I think it uh, it certainly is something that I'm proud of, and, and I appreciate all the employees that participated in that program. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Mr. North. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to um, go talk about the uh, current municipal operation structure. We are still operating under the emergency powers authorization. And Ms. Reese had explained that uh, one of the orders, the stay at home order has expired. And in light of the conversation we had with um, Representative Brady, thought this would be a good time to um, express my um, recommendation that we work with Mr. Brady or Representative Brady and whatever program he's trying to roll out for a regional opening, that we try and do something that meshes with that so that we can respectfully allow our business and our community to open back up for those that, uh, for those that want to and need to. Um, so I've sent council a request as well to weigh in to see if we can get enough support for this. And uh, I'm again, asking for your support to bring this forward sooner than later. So thank you. Ms. Smith. Thank you. Um, while I can appreciate um, the impatience expressed by Mr. Nord and a number of constituents that have reached out to all of us and shared their opinion about the desire to uh, begin opening businesses again. I, I do think it is important to act in a united front. And um, I, I do think there is very much value in a regional approach um, because to, to have a policy that looks at the town of normal separate from um, surrounding communities, the surrounding county area would be counterproductive. Um, the questions I raised with Mr. Brady about testing, um, all of the health experts are saying that testing, testing, testing is the key, that while there's much made about the low rate of infection, and thankfully, um, while any, any death is a loss, um, that we haven't experienced that experienced in urban areas. We really don't know what our situation is because we've focused the testing on only those who have either been demonstrating symptoms or are essential workers that have been exposed to that. And so um, I, I understand the anxiety, uncertainty uh, presents to people 
Um, but even those communities that are opening up um, as businesses, you can't, a, a restaurant can't make it with in order to have only 25% occupancy. They need larger participation to, to be profitable. And so um, it, it's one thing to open up the business. It's another thing for the consumers and the citizens to have the confidence that they are not taking their um, health risk in their own hands by participating and, and patronizing these businesses. So I think if, if we, again, defer to the experts who are getting much more information that is, that is shared among them than we have access to and, and participate as a region, I think as we work together, we can solve this together. Thank you. Ms. Cummings. I'm sorry, Mr. McCarthy and then Ms. Cummings. No worries, thanks, Mayor. Um, I guess I'll work backwards and uh, pick up where Ms. Smith uh, just left off uh, in a couple of ways. Um, you know, we all have different connections in our community with our residents and, and our professionals and um, I'm fortunate to have good connections with our medical community and sometimes daily, but at least weekly talking to, to our medical professionals that are on the front line of um, treating and diagnosing uh, here and seeing sick people running sick clinics. And um, they also agree with the broader national and state level recommendations that rapid testing is really our way out of this and contact tracing. Um, uh, there's been a lot talked about enough tests, but, but safe open plans are um, for better or worse based on rapid testing responses. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm just repeating what I've been told. Uh, but uh, and contact tracing, once if we start to open, we find new cases of being able to run that down. Um, one of our challenges in our community, our size is we don't have many resources to do either of those. Um, and that's really one of the biggest things that we are going to face as we open up is that we don't have rapid test responses and we don't have a lot of people to do a lot of contact tracing should we see a spike in cases as we go to open up and be able to respond appropriately as not just normal, not just Bloomington, but as an entire county, as an entire region, uh, because we do. I mean, this thing doesn't know boundaries between communities and counties. Uh, it just hits everybody. And so we need to be able to respond as a region. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can make advances on rapid testing so communities our size can be able to, to take advantage of that and that, uh, that uh, we get some relief. Uh, I know federal relief funding is not targeted for communities our size. One of the things that that type of funding could help us with is developing uh, core groups of people to be able to do contact tracing with, if we do see spikes, we can track it down and isolate it and keep it from shutting down the economy again. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, state and federal level will see this and see this as opportunities to help us on a local level be able to open up and, and respond more rapidly. Um, two other things. Um, one is uh, married to a teacher. I just want to say again, um, shout out to our uh um, cultural arts department and children's discovery museum for the steam bags out to the unit five students. Uh, when I hear they're a big, very big hit, uh, not only with the students, but with parents, uh, having their kids with something else to do while they're trying to work and also be teachers at the same time. Uh, a lot of strain is being put on people that fortunately still have jobs but are working and also trying to play teacher and teachers who are trying to support them all at the same time. That is very well appreciated by the, the unit five universe. Uh, and then lastly, I um, had a conversation with a neighbor on Sunday, yesterday, which echoed a couple I'd already have. And, and after the third one, I thought, you know, it's something I should probably share with everybody here. Uh, we had about a 30 minute conversation um, initiated by my neighbor about the hard task that we have as elected officials on our level. And certainly Mr. Brady and our federal legislators do as well is balancing the need of the economy with the need of keeping people safe. And although 30 minutes of conversation was mostly acknowledging all of the challenges we faced, we certainly didn't come up with any solutions in our backyards. Uh, but um, 
Uh, in each one of those cases, uh, those conversations ended with, thanks for all you're doing. We know it's really hard. Thanks for stepping up. And so I just want to share that with all of you is that there are people out there that appreciate that um, it's very challenging and that we're trying our best uh, and stepping up to try to represent and just want to share that out with everybody. Thanks. And, and Ms. Cummings, hopefully I'm not stealing thunder from your comments here, but um, I do know that uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors and National League of Cities is working hard at the federal level to get more equity and funding for cities uh, below 500,000. So uh, that's that's a high priority for U.S. Conference of Mayors and uh, National League of Cities. Ms. Cummings, did I do it? Did I steal your stuff? Well, only just a piece of it. So you've taken care of that. So I guess I'll start off with a lighter note first by saying happy Mother's Day to all the mothers because we won't see each other um, before then. So I wanted to say that. Um, I think, you know, you kind of started off already with a piece of what I was going to get to on the importance of um, us relying on our partnerships to um, help us as go forward and also identifying how we can as better assist our constituents through this. But the reality for me um, that we don't talk about over and over again, you know, I, I commend um, Council Member Smith and Council Member McCarthy for many of their comments. But one of the largest things that gives me pause is um, we have populations within our communities who will get hit the worst and the hardest um, if we don't do this right, because they're already suffering. Let's start off with our essential workers, because I the privilege to consider essential workers only the nurse alleged essential workers who are working at our grocery stores, who's cleaning up the hospitals, who are doing the jobs that most of you would never want to do and those are the ones who are falling sick. A lot of times those are also those who don't have health insurance. Um, they don't have access in case they do get sick. So there's a whole lot of pieces and parts. Now, I certainly agree, you know, we, government can't run without, you know, our businesses being up because our base um, revenue is off of taxes, sales tax, hotel, motel, motor fuel, and so on and so on. <clears throat> However, we've got to balance it. And to me, lives are more important. You know, you can always um, plan and take, take a look and figure out how to help one another. Once again, looking at our partnerships to see how we can help businesses restore. There's already some um, assistance out there. Some things is just as simple as, as purchasing items from our local businesses, if you can, or guards. I mean, we, 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 there's things that we can do. Um, if you're having anxiety about being in the house, you can go outside, you know, find a new activity to do as long as you're social distancing. I mean, we've got to be creative, but we also have to think beyond self and think about how we're going to move forward to ensure the health and welfare of everyone, not just a few. And Ms. Reese, you get to sweep this up. Actually, Mayor, thank you. I'm just speaking on behalf to introduce um, Ms. Gattaraju. She asked for a couple of seconds just to uh, address council for a moment. So Vasu, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Uh, I just want to say I am so sorry about the technical glitches today. Uh, despite our best efforts, we continue to run into these. Um, we've tested multiple times and yet we ran into these. I do want to particularly uh, apologize to our viewers today uh, and assure them uh, that we will be posting a video that we've recorded as part of Zoom uh, as soon as we possibly can. So I, uh, again, I'm sorry, and thank you so much for your patience with us. Thank you. And, and tying in with that, I hope that we will soon be back in the council chamber. So hopefully we have very few meetings left where we have to hold them by Zoom. So my fingers are crossed. Usually the indication of making that change is when we all figure this Zoom thing out and are very comfortable with it. <laughs> Time to retreat from it. Motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Thank you. Please call the roll. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mrs. Lorenz? Aye. Mr. Preston? Aye. Mr. McCarthy? Aye. Ms. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Nord? Aye. Mayor Coos? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all. It was a very good conversation tonight.
Thanks, everyone.